friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. Welcome to day zero of our next uh, Friday project. Um, we are going to be building an app that will allow users to create, share, and watch lists of YouTube channels. That's the idea anyways, <laughs> that's what we're gonna build. Uh, but if you've been tuning in, you know that we have been spending some time trying to choose a full stack framework. Uh, so I will summarize my findings today. So for everybody that's been watching, um, I'll give you a summary of everything we tried, what I thought of each thing, and then I'll tell you what I chose. Uh, that's the plan. I'm gonna welcome everybody in, say hi, and then we'll get right into it because I know people are antsy. They wanna they want know my choice. What did I choose? Um, so we'll do a summary of findings tell you what I chose, uh, and then we'll start building. Um, we'll do a little bit of initial planning. I think we're going to do our best this this time to um, do proper project management. <laughs> it was a hard choice, and I still, like, I, I think I'm, I'm confident in my choice, but I do wish things were better. But that it's, it's just a case of uh, uh, time. It's just going to take time, and uh, yeah. Um, and then well, I'll let you, whenever we get into it, I'll let you all vote. Like, are we going to actually just like set up the app or not even write any code yet and like design the database uh, or, or, you know, what we probably also need to do, um, is, uh, design the pages and layouts, do like some very basic wireframing. Yeah. Uh, is that a green sign or did I not notice it? Okay, <laughs> so you may notice that the layout is a little bit different. There's a green border. So I tried to figure out like what's the best what's the best border here, but you'll notice now it's like there's more editor and then you have this and it's not showing my, my title bar. And I have this scene so I can do things like, like this. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know what's the best thing to put by, because there's a little bit of space. There's always going to be a little bit of space. So like I could do this, which is like the mountain background from this scene. Uh, but I kind of, I kind of like the green. I don't know. You all tell me, is the green too much? Does it look like I'm like running screen recording software or something like that? It's a bit thick. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> We'll go with it. Honestly, it would be actually be pretty cool if uh, if chat could use a channel point redemptions to change the color. It's thick. I am in front of the border. Should I be behind the border? Actually, I don't think I can change that. That the fact that I'm in front of it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is it looks like it's uh, I, I'm doing a zoom screen share. You like the background, not the green. Okay, number one. Number two. Number one. Number two. One. Two. <laughs> well, it's it's not that it's not that important, and I can always change it. I, I'm gonna leave it like this for now. Oh, there's a lot of twos. We'll do a 30 second poll, just because, you know, I value your your opinion. <laughs> uh, I I value what you all think, and also you're the ones that have to look at it. So. Um, which one? Number one or number two? You have uh, 30. Come on. Come on, come on. You have 30 seconds to vote, or one minute to vote. This is number one. Number two. Number one. <laughs> number two. So uh, my, my MacBook is plugged in. You're right. You all won't be able to tell me when my MacBook isn't plugged in. Number one. Number two. Number one, number two. Um, did I switch it? Okay, number one is green background. <laughs> number one is green. Number two is like, you can't really even tell what it is, but it's like, it's basically the mountain pixel background. You voted for the wrong one. Did I change the meaning? It's all a wash anyways. <laughs> Here's what we'll do. I'll be more explicit about it. Um, can I end this real quick? It's gonna end soon. We'll do it. We'll do one more. We'll do one more. We'll do one more. I didn't trick you. I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> Just... uh... Switch it every two minutes. Okay. Here we go. The this will be the poll. This will be it. <laughs> Solid green. Uh, mountain pixel. 
All right, vote now. No scam, no scam. So, to let you to remind you, this is solid green. This is mountain pixel. Solid green. Mountain pixel. You know, the other thing we could do is we could look at like what my thumbnail looks like on Twitch, uh, because that's actually another thing to consider. Um. Yeah, look how good that thumbnail looks. Somebody scrolls past that and they're like, oh man, I wanna click on that green thumbnail, you know? You know? You know? I don't know. True. <laughs> True. I'm gonna sway the vote, we got 30 seconds left. Look at that. Ooh, like, you know what? A gradient, I'm not opposed to a gradient. So if we went from like green, let's try it really quick. We, actually, I think I can do it on Figma, give me a second. I hope everyone is okay with me stalling like this because I think this is, this, is, this is important. This is my branding. Um, but I think I have a compromise. I think the solid green is a little much for people. Um, but if we do a gradient, <laughs> click fade. Um, what's up, Coding Evolution? Oh, thank you, Coding Evolution. Yeah, it, the thing is like, a daily programmer is gonna it is, it is going to be a grind it absolutely is but the videos have they have long, longevity right like somebody could watch that reverse a string video or the fizzbuzz video 10 years from now and it's still going to be relevant if people are still learning how to code <laughs> 10 years from now um can someone find me what what is a what is a color that i should gradient to that that green color find me a color to gradient from or to White? I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, Yolpa Dev, is like, you can just take, take forever with the most mundane things. This is actually also hilarious to me that I literally used Figma to make a green square. Um, okay. Isn't it possible to do a gradient with Figma? Yeah. So, or no. Anybody know how to do a gradient with Figma? Okay, so I'm gonna try this from Q21 who says it's a blue. Click the solid green square where it says solid. Ah. Linear gradient. We're gonna start there and end there. Ooh, oh, and we, um, that, I like that. I'm just gonna go with it. I'm just gonna go with it. Unless, unless someone strongly, if you very much believe in, I guess I can try each one of these, but then I have to go remember which one was which. No, I want this one. Okay, I mean, that's more green. That's more green. I like the idea of flipping it. So uh, if we go from here, blue is the sky, and then uh, green, green grass. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, uh, we just got to find the right blue color. Let's go. With, let's look at this one. Wait, what? This one. So I, I mean, the light is okay. I like, yeah, I like the one from Q21, I think. Um, um, Q21. 
Can you send it again, Q21? Yeah, <laughs> there it is, okay. 128 Deb. That's it, that's the one, that's our sky! That's it, okay, here we go. Uh, I need to save this through the power of cloud syncing technology. I can easily get it over on my other computer. Um, it's pretty, all right, this is, this is a, I'm glad we did this. Thank you all for, uh, for appeasing me and, uh, and, and helping me out with that. All right, export. That, that, that. Moment of truth. Boom. Oh, that's way less in your face. It's amazing. It's amazing how how that will do that. Like, just a just a little bit a little bit of gradient, you know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. I'm glad we spent time doing this. All right, let's say hi to everyone, uh, and then I'm going to give you a recap of uh, all the things we tried. So we tried SvelteKit, Nux, Remix, and Next. For this project, I'm going to tell you which one, which one I chose, but I'm also going to give you a rundown of how I evaluated each of, the, each of the things. So yeah. Yeah, good job, Q21. Thumbnail check. It, ta it usually takes a few seconds to update, but let's see. Is there like category? Software and I don't know how to get to software and game development. Yeah, it'll take a second to update. That's also interesting when you hover, it uses my channel color. That's actually, that actually might blend really well. Yeah, so we're going to start the app today. Okay, let's say hi to everybody. Uh, if you want me to say hi to you, you can say hi, hello, hey, yo, cheers, greetings, hiya, sup. What's up? Morning, afternoon, evening, howdy. Say any one of those things. Basically, write a message that matches this regular expression, and uh, I will I will acknowledge you. We're gonna go back in time to uh, SQL Gordster was the first to say hello. Welcome in SQL Gordster. Um, I added you as a mod on Discord. I need if you filled out the form. I'm, if you haven't filled out the form, fill out the form. I'm gonna I'm gonna mail some stickers tomorrow. So, what's up, Sunny? Welcome in. Hello, Mark, and. Uh, Actually, I'll leave it on this so people know what's about to happen. And uh, Zelino, hello, what's up to callers and Two Fox and Stotney? Hello, Macaroni Pizza Pie and Pop Blip and This Max uh, and The Only Friskus. And uh, Excavator, thank you for that resub. What's up, Origin and His Glory Alone? What's up, uh, Timon uh, and Yupla and Pablo and Mihai Andre? What's up, Java Guy and The Mixed and Burnt Rice And Prasanth and Tim Turner, hello, Clicky Poo. What's up, Veritatas and uh, Data Costa and Arpats and Yu-Gi-Oh! And It's Not DG and HDB 404. And hello, David Shaw. What's up, Crypod and Battlefame and uh, Turkler Barada? What's up, Mr. Cubic? and verbatim and platinum pratt and donk and jim what's up uh, mar friends and pete pal and uh death yuli and coding evolution what's up stony eagle and fob and tj mr p and chrome and the shadow lad and porky <laughs> porky log and what's up razor sin and zayotic and i rossum and q21 and hello Pr priet ranka what's up blaze kush and Me uh, mike the tree climber and uh uh terenciani and bj sebastian what's up excavator and d gramic and wu tangsky and simic uh or simic Simic and Shiva and Goosh Propful and I Ivo. What's up, Code Stuff and Coom Joseph and DMC and Storm and Rage and, and Spaceman Smith. It's it's Calvin himself. Welcome in. What's up, uh, Matt Gutterman and Shark Turnout and Reem AI. Glad to have you. What's up, Mister Extremely? I haven't heard of that. And what's up, Roal from Austria? That's awesome. Welcome in. Glad to have you, everybody. And Fob, thank you for that gifted sub. <laughs> um. We got a lot of support so far. Uh, Berno Rice with the five months. Thank you for that. Excavator with the 24 months. I didn't see that. And then uh, Fob with the two-month uh, the uh, two -month gift. Is that what that means? Cornbread Jack. Welcome in. You're new here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for the sub. Uh, Apuru Guru uh, Apuru says, how to get the Twitch chat to stream on your desktop? Can you pull other streamers' chat? Or show? You can pull um, anyone's chat. Yeah, so I have some YouTube videos on that. Uh uh, and Crypod, thank you for that Prime resub. If you search for Coding Garden Twitch Overlay, there's a pretty sm short video. I code for food. Thank you for the Prime as well. Uh, both both new Primers and Blaze Kush. You're all new. Thank you. Thank you for for uh, for supporting me. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, how do I find it? 
it's 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 going to be in the content playlist. There's like a, a 20 minute video on like it's super easy to 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 integrate with Twitch chat. Let me get it for you. Um, this one, and then this one. Build a simple web page to listen to Twitch chat. The video is 20 20 minutes long, but you can you can learn how to do it like in in 10 minutes. It's really easy. Uh, and burnt all rice. Thank you for that gift as well. Okay. Is it possible to start my first software engineering job as a backend developer? It's definitely possible. I think in in the industry, people tend to think that like front end is for beginners and back end is for like people with experience. But that's not the case. They do uh, there there are companies that will hire entry level back end developers. Uh, you just have to find a company that that does that. Listening to YouTube chat, not quite, because YouTube chat is hard. <laughs> um, I think. Yeah, YouTube chat is hard because you have to pull it and there's no real-time API. The thumbnail looks great. Glad to hear it. Um, so yeah. All right, let's talk about this. So for those of you that are just joining us, first we're going to do a, um, a summary of all of our findings. So if you didn't know, over the past two weeks, we tried everything. We tried, well, not everything. We tried these full stack frameworks. We tried Svelte, Vue, React, Next.js, or sorry, uh, Remix, and then uh, Next.js. And we're trying to pick one because we're going to build an app with that thing. Uh, Zaotic says, am I planning to update the travel log app for today's frameworks? Um, is that the one I built a long time ago with to like just React and, and, and Express? Is that the one you're talking about? Because it would be cool to rebuild with one of these. But that's not the plan. Right now, the thing that we're going to build over the next, I mean, it's going to take us a lot of Fridays. We're only going to work on it on Friday, so you know if you tune in on Friday, you won't miss anything. Um, but we're going to make an app that allows users to create, share, and watch lists of YouTube channels. Uh, and I'll talk more about the idea in, in a second there. Yeah, yeah so, and, and so some of our criteria here was that, like, it, it cannot be in beta or even in release candidate. Like, we're looking for things that are production ready, well tested. We want to work in a mature, a somewhat mature ecosystem. Um, so th that those those were really our, our um, some of our criteria. Now, when you when you pick one of these, there's they all do these kinds of things, uh, and that's why. So if you if you're thinking like why isn't X in this list, um, the re the reason might be is that it doesn't support this. So all of these frameworks support hybrid rendering, meaning it'll figure out if you need a single page application versus server side rendering or a multi multi page app or static site generated. Like each one of these has their own way of uh, letting you do that and sometimes figuring it out automatically. Yeah, so Angular would have been Angular Universal. Um, I guess you're right. Angular Universal could have been on the list, but uh, it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it took me a week. Well, it took me five streams to try each one of them. But they also do a lot of, a lot of other things, optimized bundling, search engine optimization, uh, file-based routing. They allow you to do like API functions and data loading. All of this stuff, these, these frameworks allow you to do that, right? Because each one is a framework around some UI framework, right? So Svelte is a UI framework. Vue, React, those are UI frameworks. And then these are meta frameworks on top of them that give you all of this stuff and allow you to use that said front-end framework. Now, these were not the things I was evaluating it on. I was actually evaluating these on the ecosystem because um, honestly, like especially like like uh, Remix and SvelteKit, they have really, really cool ideas about how to do all of these things. Um, but they're not, but they're both a little bit new. Uh, and uh, Apuru, Apuru uh, Gru, thank you very much for that uh, for that prime. Um, but they're but they're but they're newer and uh, like Nuxt has been around for a long time, but Nuxt three is newer. Next.js is the oldest of all of them. It it, it really is uh, kind of the precursor to all of these and what a lot of these were inspired by and then also like iterated on. Um, but again, we, were, we weren't looking at any of this. We were actually looking at the ecosystem itself because typically when you're working with one of these frameworks, you're not just working with the framework, you're working with a lot of libraries and other stuff. Uh, so what we cared about was project setup. How easy is it to get a project up and going? How easy is it to update our configs? How easy is it to add Tailwind? How easy is it to get a component library going? How easy is it to get social auth with Google? Which if you've been watching, you know it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> like for whatever reason, uh, a lot of the libraries we're using are very buggy, um, are, like they need work. 
I'll let you know. And then uh, also, does it support full stack type safety? So um, <laughs> here we go. Uh, first up, uh, we tried SvelteKit. And, and real quick, um, if you want to actually go back and watch where, the videos where I tried these things, uh, there's a playlist over on YouTube. So this playlist called Choosing a Full Stack Framework, um, it has uh, me trying each thing. Each one was a different live stream, and, and like, uh, they're hours long. <laughs> so, like, because it takes a long time to try the thing and debug the thing, and then also, like, answer questions from Twitch chat. So, uh, right now, I'm kind of, like, summarizing uh, six, six days of, of streaming in, like, under 10 minutes. Um, okay, SvelteKit. In terms of project setup, SvelteKit, really good. We give it 10 out of 10 seedlings. Um, they, they have a command line tool. It asks you lots of questions, like, do you want to use ESLint? Do you want to use Prettier? I like when a CLI tool uh, basically asks you a lot of questions and, and lets you decide what you want to do, which is, and, and it does. So I give it a 10 out of 10. For ESLint setup, it gets a low score. I mean, this is partially me. Like, I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. And let's, let's show you these code examples really quick. Um, so let's look at our Svelte example. And... We we did our we tried our darned, darndest <laughs> to get this set up. So um, the the thing is, so I prefer to have ESLint set up with the Airbnb config. I don't think Prettier is enough. Prettier uh, handles formatting, but e ESLint and especially the Airbnb config uh, handle uh, linting, which is a thing that I care about. Uh, and so it it came set up with a base ESLint config, but when I was when I was trying to add Airbnb, that's where we ran into issues. Uh, let's take a quick stretch. Yeah, and so, I mean, we when we talk about uh, Next.js, we'll talk about that T thing. Um, but, so, it came with ESLint, but I wanted to add Airbnb to it. And we got it working, sort of. So if you look at any file that is just a straight TypeScript file, look at this. I remove a semicolon, and it yells at me. It's like, hey, you need a semicolon. And that's what I want. I want my, I want my editor yell at, to yell at me. But we couldn't get it working in actual Svelte files. So Svelte uh, components have this script section, and you'll notice if I do this, uh, the linter isn't working. Now, I could probably get it working, but I spent like an hour, I, I, I didn't get it working, which is why I'm giving it a two out of 10. That said, I could probably get it working if I spent more time with it. All right. Uh, Next up was Tailwind setup. This is really easy in Svelte Kit. Uh, there's this Svelte add command that comes with Svelte Kit that has all kinds of things that you can add, uh, and Tailwind is one of them. So you literally just say Svelte add Tailwind, and it automatically configures all of that for you. Uh, it essentially generates a Tailwind config. It generates a post CSS config, a post CSS file. It, it just creates all of those files. Done. You don't have to do anything manually. It's really cool. Really cool. Uh, so yeah, 10 out of 10. Uh, component library setup. We had a little issues with this because uh, because we're using Tailwind, we wanted to find a component library built on top of Tailwind. So we started with Flowbyte, uh, which is cool, really nice. Uh, and you can use it standalone as just a Tailwind plugin, but they also have a separate library, library called Flowbyte Svelte. And this is an actual Svelte component library. So for instance, if you want a button, uh, you can import this component from Flowbyte Svelte, and then it's styled like it would be from Flowbyte. But we couldn't get it working with Svelte Kit. So this works with Svelte, but I think there, there's some issues right now with getting it working in server-side rendering. So we, we scrapped that, and then we went over to um, a framework called Skeleton. And so this is built on top of uh, Tailwind, but it's a UI kit for Svelte Kit. And uh, we really like this. Uh, what, what did I give this? I gave it a 7 out of 10. Uh, the Flowbyte one... Uh, Zero out of ten. Like we couldn't get it working. It was a, it was a headache. Skeleton, real nice. Uh, I think the reason I gave it a seven out of ten is like I missed one section in the docs when I was setting it up, where, like I didn't include this, and we were like scratching our heads, like why isn't it working? But once we got it working, it's really cool. They have uh, a bunch of like pre predefined themes that you can choose from, um, and where do we find the uh, components? Um, yeah, they have elements. It's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, I haven't looked at carbon, carbon, carbon components. No, I only try, only tried those two. So gave it a seven out of ten. Uh, in terms of social auth, you might have heard 
that uh, AuthJS is now a thing. And their uh, announcement of the library was the fact that they had a Svelte Kit adapter for AuthJS. So AuthJS is the next version of Next Auth. Next Auth is specifically for Next.js, but Auth.js is an initiative to make the library uh, framework agnostic so that it can work with things like Svelte Kit or Solid Start. So we tried to use this probably like two or three days after the announcement that they made it, and we had a really hard time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm giving this a two out of 10. Now, we gave it a second chance. Um, uh, what was it, Wednesday of last week? Um, or Friday, was it Friday of last week? I don't even remember, but we, we tried again because obviously using a brand new library, like they even say it in the docs, like it's experimental. You can expect some, some things to be wrong with it, but we, we debugged it for hours. We found a GitHub issue. They fixed it, but then it, it took them like five days or so before they merged it. And so the other day I installed the latest version to get that fix and, uh, Overall, it was working, but there's now there's still a bug. So like, if you if you look, uh, and you've never used uh, Next Auth before, the, the, it's pretty cool, and that you can set it up. So let's say you set up um, a an OAuth provider. This is literally all the code it takes to do that. You you just put in this one file. Done, good to go. Um, but you can then integrate it with a database. So if you look at their, um, I guess I want reference. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if you look in their uh, docs, they have database adapters and spe specifically they have a Prisma adapter. So this is, this is super nice, right? So you have this one setup, you choose your provider and then you say, uh, use Prisma as my database. And then in their docs, they say, this is the schema that you need and it handles everything. You literally put this schema in your Prisma schema, and it's supposed to be able to just insert users, create sessions, good to go. Well, actually, <laughs> when you're integrating with Google, uh, there's right now there's an issue where the, the property uh, that comes back from Google is expires in instead of expires at. Now, of course, you could go in and update the DB schema, uh, but now, if you have other OAuth providers that depend on that, it's broken and there's not an easy way to fix it. So, two out of ten. It'll eventually it'll probably be better, but right now I gave it a two out of ten. All right. Uh, in terms of full stack type safety, uh, Svelte is actually <laughs> actually really cool. I give it a, a, an eight out of ten, uh, and it is uh, built in and it does code generation. So, for example, uh, we have this page.server file. So in Svelte. I, I, it's a little bit awkward. I think it's going to be a little bit awkward to get used to, but it's like uh, every route has a page file and it could be a server file. If it's a server file, you know that that is going to run on the server. It's not client side code. And then a page.svelte file will uh, be pre rendered on the server, but you can have client side code inside of that. Giant CJ. Yeah. I mean, was that weird? Was that a weird transition? <laughs> That was my first time trying it. I think I think it worked. Um, but for example, I have this this uh, page.server file, and uh, it ties together with the page.svelte file. So right now, it's my only route. You could create subfolders and subroutes, and basically, when those two files are next together, they they cor they they work together. So this is basically the backend code for the landing page. Um, and I have a function defined here called load that returns an object that has an items property with a bunch of items. It was neat. Cool. Cool. <laughs> So I defined my, my stuff here. Notice, I didn't have to define an interface. I just defined the thing. And then inside of our actual component file, I can import this page data type, which is uh, generated. It's gener generated types. Uh, but now if I look at my data property, it has all of those types ready to go. So I, the, the only type that I have to import in any of my components is page data, and then the, the types flow through. So I don't have to... Uh, import a separate type or a separate interface. I mean, you could, you know, obviously there's gonna be use cases where you might want to do that, but it is really nice that you don't have to, right? The types just flow through. You define your backend route. Basically, this is like your, uh, uh, the code that will run on the server before the page gets rendered, right? And uh, you can do that stuff here. This returns an object, the types flow through, and then you can use those types in here. So data is typed, and then we're doing, like when we're doing an, an iteration, um, everything is typed, it's beautiful. And Chris Nova, welcome in. 
Thank you for the raid. Uh, right now, we're talking about choosing a full stack framework, and we're, we're recapping my findings, because over the past um, basically like two weeks, I've been trying all of these things. But thank you for the raid. What what, what do you do? <laughs> who, who are you? I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't heard you heard your name before. Um, uh, Rust go grpc. Awesome. Thank you so much for the raid. Actually, have we raided you before? I don't know. Welcome in. Thank you for the raid. Uh, much appreciated. And I'm not following. I will definitely follow. But welcome in, raiders. Um, like I mentioned, we tried a bunch of different full stack frameworks. Specifically right now, I'm recapping SvelteKit, and I'm talking about the uh, full stack type safety. So like in your back end, you can have code that looks like this, and then uh, the types flow through. Um, well, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> The, de the decision is going to be at the end of this slide deck, so I'm, I'm leaving you in suspense. Uh, so yeah, 8 out of 10. All right. In summary, it seems it, it, Svelte Kit, uh, it seems fine, right? Like the, the main issues we had were linting and finding an auth library that is, is working and production ready, right? Everything else about Svelte Kit seems pretty great, and um, we haven't... I talked about it earlier, but we haven't even got into like how it does these things differently than the other frameworks. But it, I kind of like the way that it does some of these things, right? So, okay, that's my that's that's felt kit. Um, let's move on to uh, Nuxt. So, if you're not familiar with Nuxt, Nuxt is the the full stack framework for Vue.js, and they're in a bit of a transition period because uh, Nuxt version two. Uh, was out for a long time, and it actually took a while before they got Nuxt version 3, which is compatible with Vue 3. So if you go to nuxjs.org, this is the documentation for Nuxt 2. If you go to nux.com, this is the documentation for Nuxt 3. Um, let's take a quick stretch, and we'll answer this question from uh, Cyberdelic Shroom, who says, what is linting? What is linting? Uh, think of it like a spell checker for your code. Um, and the reason I like it, especially like on a team project, is I can set up my linting configuration that says we require semicolons all strings should be uh single quotes instead of double quotes anytime you have an anonymous uh function it should be an arrow function these are all things that i can put into my linting config and then my editor will yell at me if i'm not doing that thing so for example right now uh, look in this code. If I get rid of this, uh, well, you, you saw that, but if I get rid of this semicolon, I literally get a red squiggly that says, hey, you should put a semicolon. Um, now, of course, if you know anything about JavaScript or TypeScript, it'll technically work without semicolons. Uh, and the Shivas, thank you for that. Sanjay developer, awesome. Um, so the code will still work. Like basically linting is things that are mostly opinion based. A lot of times there are, there are good reasons to have the opinion of like, you should use semicolons. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into that debate, though, but that's what a linter is. It basically uh, makes sure that all of our code is consistent, especially if we're working on a team of developers where there might be slight inconsistencies between developers. The linter is going to make sure that everyone commits code that looks similar. And then when we're doing code reviews, we don't have to worry about code style. We know everyone is adhering to that, that, uh, that linting config, and we can care about the stuff that's important, like does the code work or is the code work written in an efficient way, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and like a Pathogen is saying, like there are linter rules that actually do make a lot of sense. Like technically the code still works, but linter rules will still catch things that might result in bugs. But yeah, okay, let's talk about Nux. Uh, I saw a comment earlier. When I was like, so I was like, well, we've got Nux.com versus Nux.js. It is confusing. I think eventually everything will be migrated to Nux, but but the issue is because Nux 2 has been around for so long, people still need the old documentation. There, there are still people working in, like, I mean, it's weird to even call it a legacy app. It's not a legacy app. It's just it's not version 3, which is a complete rewrite. Um, so <laughs> but this is, this is it. Uh, and it's built on top of, of Vue.js. So... Uh, if you've watched Coding Garden in the past, Vue.js is really one of my favorite uh, front-end fr frameworks. Um, it's really nice. It really jives with how I think about front-end code and, and data binding. And uh, Honestly, like data binding for a lot of people is a dirty word, but it, it doesn't really even do data binding. It works the same way as React. There's a single dire unidirectional data flow. It doesn't matter. Vue is cool. I like Vue a lot. And so Nuxt basically uh, is a wrapper around Vue that adds all of these uh, full-stack features. So 
talked about this earlier, but these full stack frameworks do a lot of things. And this is what Nuxt is doing on written on top of the, uh, the view framework itself. So in terms of project setup, I give this a five out of 10. So whenever you generate a Nuxt project, it is bare. It literally, there's like four files uh, and you have one app.view file, which is your entry point and everything else you have to create yourself. So I created the layouts folder, the pages folder, like it does expect these folders to exist like with a specific name and you have to read the docs for that. So if you go to the docs and you go through getting started and you look at the guide, this actually shows you what a full directory structure would look like. Look at me, I can point. Um, you can see what the, the, the and then uh, in the docs here, you can actually click on any one of these folders, like let's say pages, and it's gonna tell you what that folder is for, what you should put in there, that kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of possible folders, but when it generates the app, there are no folders, no folders at all. So that's why I'm giving it a five out of 10. And it's like, uh, you, could, you could hold people's hand a little bit more. Um, so yeah. Uh, so five out of 10. And then in terms of uh, linting setup, really this is because of the view ecosystem. So literally in the, the view, um, uh, what is the word I'm trying to say? The view GitHub organization. So uh, all of the, uh, the view projects are under Vue.js. So like the, the core library, everything else. Nuxt isn't technically from the core team, but all the other view stuff is. But if you look uh, in the in the view GitHub organization, they have a bunch of examples on how to set up the ESLint conf config Airbnb with all different kinds of view apps. So the reason it was so easy to set up ESLint Airbnb config was because uh, the view ecosystem has all of the example configs that we could pull from. So I'm gonna take a quick pause. I think I missed quite a few chats, but uh, let's see if I missed if if there's anything I should respond to. <laughs> Uh, and Jono Codes, welcome in. Yeah, um, um, you're a member of the Rustations. That's awesome. Glad to, glad to have you. When are we exploring Redwood? Um, eventually, so the thing is, Redwood does not do uh, this single page application versus server side rendering versus multi page applications versus static site generating, as far as I know. I could be wrong on that, but when I, when I was reading the documentation, Redwood base, base, basically gives you a GraphQL U a API with a React front end which would just be a single page application. So Redwood doesn't do this extra stuff, as far as I know. And that's that's why it's not included in, in this list. Where are we at? We're here, okay. And welcome in, uh, Fafinabu, glad to have you. What's my front end tooling? What do you mean? <laughs> I use, I mean, I, I like Vue a lot. Probably I've written more React than anything else. I've written a little bit of Svelte. Yeah, and, and I think this is a good point about like having the setup that gets generated with nothing. And we kind of talked about that. Like basically by generating the app with only an app.view, you have to go to the documentation. You have to go to the docs. You have to read about, okay, what folders do I need? What are those folders for? So it is a good learning mechanism. But I think if you already know what all of those folders are for, you probably want a more fleshed out setup. So it depends, right? It, it depends. Um, but I, I could see that, stand, that standpoint, yeah. Yeah, so we have, I haven't told you my decision, decision yet. <laughs> I guess that's true, uh, TJMR, and I didn't even talk about that because uh, with Nuxt, they have a CLI. Um, it's called Nuxy. And then Nuxy has commands for adding different things. I didn't actually use the CLI, though, um, and I didn't use those commands. API. Here we go. So there's this Nuxy add command, and then you can add components, composable, layout, plugin, page. So if you run this from the command line, it's gonna actually generate those for you. That is a good point. I actually didn't even get to explore their, their CLI. Um, but that is what, I mean, maybe they could get a little bit better than a five out of 10, because <laughs> if you're actually using the CLI, it can do a lot. Is such a bare starting app good or bad for learning? I would argue it's good for learning but it's cumbersome for someone who just wants to get up and go and, and maybe already knows a few things. But if you're learning, it's great because it forces you to go over to the guide to read about each folder, like what each one is for. So yeah, I thought I was gonna quit saying them. Look, I, I literally, <laughs> literally, um, I guess you can't see it. Let me show on this one. This, this piece of paper right here says no um. A few ums are okay, I guess. I don't know. 
<laughs> now I now it's in my in front of mine that I shouldn't say um or uh. Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's called Airbnb because the engineers at Airbnb uh, were the ones that created it. Yeah. It has nothing to do with, uh, I mean, the, the linting file itself has nothing to do with rental properties or whatever. Uh, and hey, Nishark, welcome in. What's up, Oscar? Glad to have you. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there's no reason at all to use them anymore. You mean like the, the frameworks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we did talk about this as well because for auth, we use Sidebase Nuxt auth. And if you look at Sidebase, I'll talk about that in a second. Thank you for bringing that up. But I'll show you Sidebase because the thing is, they're not the core library, they're third party, but they do have like a more fleshed out, fleshed out setup. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alrighty, everyone. Thank you for making fun of me. Uh, let's keep going. So, uh, project setup, I'll upgrade it to like seven out of 10 because honestly, if you use the CLI, yeah, okay. Tailwind setup, 10 out of 10. Uh, if you look on the Nuxt website, they have this module section, and anyone can publish a module that can integrate with with uh, with the with Nuxt and the CLI. So if you search for Tailwind in here, it's there. If you search for Auth, you'll see the one that we used. There's, there's a bunch of things, and people can publish them, and then they can be easily added to a Nuxt app. So we just used this uh, Tailwind one, and we instantly had Tailwind up and going. It generated the config file for us. Um, we went in and configured it for Daisy UI, which is the component library. We gave it a 10 out of 10. So if you, if you watch me talk about SvelteKit, we tried Flowbyte with SvelteKit, we scrapped that. Then we used Skeleton, which is specific to SvelteKit. That worked. Um, and then from here on out, every other framework we tried, we just used Daisy UI. Uh, so Daisy UI is a component library um, written on top of Tailwind. And the reason we chose it is because they have all these cool themes. Not the reason. One of the, one of the reasons is they also have this theme called Forest. And then it looks like Coding Garden Green. Look at that. They got a nice green, green logo here. If you look at the buttons, they got nice green buttons. Um, but they have a lot of themes you can choose from. Daisy UI is pretty slick. Uh, but that's what we use. We set it up. Easy. Let's take a quick stretch. Also, I kind of need some water. Vite with Nux? I think it's... I don't know if Nuxt uses Vite. I actually have no idea. Um, does it? We probably, I, I should probably know that. Okay, social auth. Give it a four out of 10. <laughs> so so this, is, this is the side base thing that somebody brought up earlier. So again, if you go to modules over here on the Nuxt website, you search for auth, um, you're gonna find Nuxt auth. This is not from the core team. This is from a team called Sidebase. And uh, what they have done is written a library that wraps next auth. Now, this may sound familiar, right? Because auth.js is, an, is a new thing that's, that is making next auth framework agnostic. Uh, Sidebase did this first. Um, and so if you look at, look, at their, look at their library, basically it's written on top of next auth, but Re, re wrapped and reworked so that it can work with Nuxt. I think eventually, eventually the AuthJS team is going to release a plugin for Nuxt, and so this probably won't need to exist anymore. This one here probably won't need to exist anymore when they release it, but they haven't released it yet, and so right now this is kind of all we got. Um, so we did that. Why does it seem like Nuxt is the next copycat? I mean, because it is. They, they all of these copied from each other or learned from each other, right? So. Uh, Next.js was was the first of its kind, but Remix, Nux, SvelteKit, they're all they're all doing similar things that were all inspired by Next, and they're doing things differently because some of the things that um, um, that Next does isn't the best and could be iterated on. So that's why other other ones pop up. And uh, what do I want to say? Challenge the status quo. <laughs> That's what they do. Okay, so there's this there's this library, uh, and if you look at the Sidebase website, they actually have quite a few modules and plugins for the Nuxt ecosystem. Um, so if you look at Sidebase, uh, they have um, Nuxt auth, Nuxt session, Nuxt Prisma, and they actually have a CLI tool to generate a Nuxt app that's a little more full featured than just the plain old app that you get with. Um, 
the Nuxi CLI. So they technically have another CLI tool you, you could use. We, we didn't try that though. We just used the, the one from Nuxt itself. And then they're the creators of, of Nuxt Auth. Okay, uh, so the reason I'm giving it a four out of 10 is because, um, how do I talk about this? <laughs> it's like, um, it is it is nice that I was able to share my um, my Prisma config with the Svelte Kit app that I had already worked on. You can see this is our setup here. Um, does this give us a TypeScript error? Yeah. So this this is weird that there's like a TypeScript error that needs to be fixed. I think the 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 main issue is um, when we were using it, Nuxt auth was dependent on a specific version of next auth. And when we installed it, we had a newer version, and so that broke some things. Eventually, once we figured out that we needed to lock the version of next auth, we got it working. But I don't like that because it's an old version of next auth. So uh, if you look at, um, yeah, also I'll talk about that in a second. Thank you, uh, uh, 4K got it official. So there, there are a few options when it comes to auth in the Nuxt ecosystem, and, and I'll, I'll definitely talk about that. Uh, but for uh, next auth, which uses next auth, you have to lock the dependency. So if you look at next off, it current version is 4.18.7. Nuxt auth, which is the one that wraps this, is locked to version 4.18.0. And as, as long as you have that version installed, everything will work. But the reason I probably wouldn't reach for this library is like with with an auth library, you you want the latest updates, right? You you want to be able to um, have the, the latest bug fixes, sometimes like security fixes, you, you want that. So until Nuxtoth can uh, work with the latest version of Nuxtoth, that's a pretty big issue, uh, which is why I'm giving it a, a 4 out of 10. Now, they're probably, they're probably working on it. Yeah, so 4.18.1 had the breaking changes. They haven't fixed it yet. They're working on it, but when we tried it, it didn't work unless we locked the version, and I didn't really want to lock the version. Okay, but let's talk about other options for auth in the Nuxt ecosystem because... It is a bit fragmented. So, okay, you look at this module, and you're like, oh, this seems great. This seems great. Awesome. This is for Nux 2. Remember we talked about earlier that uh, Nux 2 is not Nux 3? This is for Nux 2. And the thing is, we, we looked at their docs, and we couldn't find anything that said it didn't work with Nux 3. So, like, all right, let's do it. We're going. We're installing things. We're going. And then at one point, it was like, you must use Vuex. But if you know about the Vue ecosystem, you know in Vue 3, we use Pina, not Vuex. So you're like, oh no, that's not gonna work. Um, so what, what, what we did find though, is there's a community fork of this to work with Nux 3. I, if, if somebody wants to link me to it, or I, I can't remember what it was. So like, probably like Nux 3 auth or something like that. Um, Let's search GitHub. What's up, Alka? Welcome in. Full of vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's it's tricky because a lot of them are build tool vulnerabilities that you technically wouldn't have to worry about in production. Uh Someone help me find it. <laughs> so basic, basically what someone did, um, wait, what is this auth module? That, wait, is this even a different one? No, that's that one. That's the one we were just looking at. Next auth. Let me just look through my previous links. If you can't find it, does it really exist? I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, let's search npm for it. Nuxt auth. But all of that to say, somebody wrote a um, a fork of this that works with Nux3 and the Pina store. We didn't use it because at the same time, the Nux core team is also working on a new version that will work with Nux3. Basically, it's, it's a hot mess. It's a big old hot mess. And... Um, and the other thing is, like, I, I wanted to try using Sidebase Auth, this one, uh, because because it was based on Nuxt, uh, Next Auth, we could use the exact same database schema that we used with SvelteKit and Auth, AuthJS Core or AuthJS. 
which is why we, we opted to use this one. Um, I didn't dream it. It's somewhere. I'm sorry I couldn't find it, but basically it's a fork of this that works with version 3. We didn't even try that. If we would have tried that, it probably would have worked, but I, I, the, the tricky part about it is it's just a basic fork. They don't have updated documentation, so you would be using that, referencing this documentation, and then also have to cross-reference to make sure you're doing the next three things, not the next two things. I, we didn't really want to do that, so um, that's why we didn't use that library. Couldn't find a grain of sand on the beach. I mean, it has like 300 stars on GitHub. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this smartwatch is from Amazfit. But um, I specifically am using Gadget Bridge. Let's, let's do a quick, um, a quick tangent to let you all know about this, this fancy little thing called Gadget Bridge. So there are a lot of uh, Chinese-made uh, smartwatches on the market. Uh, and typically, you need to install the app from... The, um, the company that uh, that makes that, that smartwatch. And that's a lot of personal info to potentially be going to servers in another country. And potentially, it doesn't even have to be another country, just like a company that you may or may not trust. Uh, so Gadget Bridge is really cool because it works with all of these um, uh, watches that uh, typically you have to install the app for the manufacturer of that watch. With this, you can just use Gadget Bridge, and Gadget Bridge is completely open source, and the, the code base itself uh, does not have network access. So literally, there's an Android app that has access to all of the, the biometrics, right? It has access to like Bluetooth control and notifications and everything it needs to be able to like forward stuff to the watch, but it doesn't have network access, which means if the app was ever compromised, like it couldn't even make a network request to send your data anywhere, which is pretty cool. So. I has I have the Amazfit Bip S, and then I'm using Gadget Bridge to uh, get notifications and then like sync my uh, data back to my phone. So that's a thing. Cool. Smartwatches seem neat, but they seem like a security risk, and I'm paranoid about that. Yes, yeah, so I'll never get a smartwatch. But yeah, I think honestly, like that, like I felt exactly the same way, which is why I I'm using Gadget Bridge. And you can, I mean, you can you can audit their source code if you if you know Java. Um, you can uh, like they have a huge community of people that are basically they same idea, right? Like we we don't pretty paranoid about just sending all of our data to some other company. Ah, oh, glad to hear it, Mihai Andre. Glad to hear it. All right, I do need to go get some water really quick. So when I come back, uh, we will talk about full stack type safety in Nuxt. Uh, but I'll be right back. Uh, at somebody in chat and compliment them. Give them a nice old compliment and I'll, and I'll be right back. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, we're back. We're back. You all, you all are kind. Thank you. Thank you for actually adding people in the chat. That's fun. Yeah, and have my my invisible my invisible space cup. <clears throat> all right, where were we? We're talking about full stack type safety in uh, in Nuxt. So, um, what does that mean? Actually, this is honestly this is. The coolest thing about Nuxt, uh, and actually I haven't even talked about like what Nuxt can do, but when you're working in a Nuxt app, they actually have a bunch of automatic imports. There's an, I haven't made a, I haven't made a choice yet. And Arturo, thank you for that prime, much appreciated. <laughs> um, but 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 uh, 
check this out. So I'm in I'm in this file. This is called users.ts, and it's inside of the server folder and then the API folder. So this, uh, if you're comparing this to like Next.js, this is kind of like a serverless function, or could end up being a serverless function in the API folder. But check it out. So I have define event handler uh, and bgnyc. It's been a while. Uh, thank you for that for that prime. Um, I have define event handler. It finds users in my database and then returns them. But if you're a keen JavaScript developer, you'll notice that I did not import define event handler. Um, in Nuxt, there are a bunch of things that are just automatically imported for you and globally available. It's magic. Some of you might hate that. You might just be <laughs> like, no, I do not like that. Um, yeah, that's nasty. That's too much magic. But the thing is, like, the more I look at like larger code bases in like Next.js or even like Remix and even like SvelteKit, it just gets really boilerplatey and really messy. Um, so I, I think it could grow on you. I think it can great grow on you. Why would anyone hate auto import? Because of the magic. Like until you get used to it, you have no idea, potentially no idea what's available to you. Um, unless you like read the documentation. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and interesting. Yeah, it's funny that all the chat messages were like, "Ew." Some people like this. Some people like this. You know. Um, so that's one interesting thing is that these are like globally available. And then also like if you look inside the view components. Um, for instance, uh, things like use fetch is globally available. Uh, there's also uh, define uh, page meta that's globally available. You'll notice I'm getting type completion because uh, the all, all of this is like TypeScript generated types and like basically it's it says that those types are available globally. So like you still get editor support, which is pretty cool, um, but they they all get imported. All right, so let's talk about uh, full stack type safety though. So I have this API route. It queries my database for all of the users and then returns them like so. Now, obviously, in the real world, you wouldn't make all of the users in your database available to anybody via the API. This is just an example because it's the only data we had access to. Um, but it's doing the thing. And uh, you'll notice that this is an array of type user. It's fully typed because of the Prisma client. And um, that type is there. Now, inside of the component, if I need to call that route, it's like magic. It's magic. So if I do use fetch, look at this. If you're used to TRPC, you're like, oh yeah, I get that. But look at that. All of my API routes, type completion. It literally tells me all of the routes that I could potentially make a request against, uh, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and then once I do that, the types flow through as well. So if I look at data, uh, it's a ref, which is a way we how we deal with um, uh, data that's potentially changing in view. But it's a ref that has users on it, and users is of type user. So you'll notice. I didn't have to import the types. I didn't have to define interfaces, and and it's it's kind of like like the best of TRPC like like embedded in the framework. You know, it's pretty cool. And and the added benefit here, or the added bonus, is um, this page can be server rendered. <laughs> data, so data is potentially undefined. Value is potentially undefined. So that's why we have the question marks there. Yeah, I mean. I can get rid of that. <laughs> Wait, there's more. So um, when, actually, I'm going to spin this up really quick. Do I have the dependencies? Because I want to show you the magic. The magic. OK. Um, so uh, if I, so you'll notice right here, th this is where I'm listing out the users on the page. I, the app is ugly. <laughs> Disregard that. Right here is where I'm listing out the users that came from the API. Um, and those are server-side rendered, right? So the initial page load is server-side rendered. If I curl this web page, the HTML that I get back is going to have that data hydrated inside of it. And you'll see a list item um, that has my, my name in it um, right here, right here. Well, that's the data. Yeah, I guess t technically, like it hydrates it, hydrates the initial page load, and then like in injects that data, right? So the initial page load actually does not have any um, uh, XML HTTP request. There's no API request being made. The initial page load is server side rendered. But watch this. If I go to the about page, and then I come back to the home page, we see an XML HTTP request. So Nuxt is able to take this little bit of code right here and know that when it's server-side rendered, uh, basically have direct access to 
this function over here during the server side render. So like this isn't an HTTP request to its to itself when it's being server side rendered. It literally is in the same JavaScript context to uh, invoke this function, get the data back, and then and then uh, inject it. But then when it noticed that I'm navigating. Uh, via single page application, then it does it turns that into an actual HTTP request. Yeah, it's not it's not XML. I mean, X, it says X, X, XHR in my tab. X, that's what XHR stands for. But yeah, I'm getting JSON data. It's an HTTP request. Um, can you force it to always do an SSR? Yeah, I think so. So like right now, the way that I have the link, uh, you can look at my nav, which is in my layout. Um, I have a Nux link. There's probably a way of doing a link that uh, will always trigger a full re-render. Uh, yeah. But the, uh, but the beautiful thing about that, right, is like in the past, that would have taken a lot of code to like differentiate the back-end request versus the front-end request. Like doing the same thing in, in Next.js requires a bunch of duplicate code. So this is really nice. Uh, and you'll see, like, I'm literally getting in JSON data here, and like the framework is kicked in is like loading it into the page. Um, so it's awesome. I will mention SvelteKit does a very similar thing, but I, I do prefer, like, to me, I like the magic. I like the, I like the way this is done here versus how it's done in SvelteKit. Um, but regardless. Okay, so I give it a 10 out of 10. It's really nice. <laughs> uh, in summary, Nuxt is really cool. Like, I, so pr I, I like Vue.js. I, like, Nuxt has all of this magic. Bit. Like, Nuxt is definitely the most magic of all of the ones that we tried. And I like that about it. That said, it's very new. It's very new, right? So like, it took a really long time to go from V2, which is this one, to uh, now version 3, which means the ecosystem has not had time to catch up. So like the, the auth module that we wanted to use is it's kind of working, but there are some issues. That's probably the main hangup I have with Nux is that it's so new, the ecosystem is so young we're going to have some issues trying to find other libraries because a component library and uh, an auth library aren't the only things we're going to need. We're going to need other stuff. Um, and it's possible that there, it, does, it doesn't exist yet. So that's really, really my main concern with, with choosing Nux is like, it's so new. The ecosystem is young. Yeah. Got released two months ago. So yeah. Okay. Uh, remix. Remix is cool. If you go to remix.run, you can learn about it. If you just scroll their page, like this is a beautifully designed marketing website that tells you like all the stuff that it does. This is probably one of the coolest things it has going for it is this idea of uh, nested routing. So you'll notice that like you have the main page, then you have like the like master detail views, like the detail view. And then within the detail view, you even have like a sub page. It's really good at doing like nested routes like that. Um, it loads fast, and honestly, their documentation is, is one of the things that stands out the most about Remix. The documentation is really well done, really well done. Um, but project generation, 11 out of 10. <laughs> like, so if you, go, if you go through the Remix uh, docs and you look at the, like, the blog tutorial, it walks you through generating the app, um, and they actually have several templates available to you. Uh, how can I find it? Um, did, did the docs change since the last time I was here? Here we go, the stacks. The stacks. Um, they have pre-configured templates for all of the things that you might want to do. Like, you really would call, like, Remix is the, like, production-ready framework. Like they have, they have everything that you might need. Uh, and so they have several different stacks that you can choose from the blue stack, the indie stack, the grunge stack. Uh, we chose the indie stack and we're kind of just blown away about what we got out of the box. Like it, it did generate a lot of code and a lot of auth code, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's really nice that it just all comes out of the box. It kind of was a breath of fresh air because none of these other frameworks did that. So 11 out of 10. Setting up the ESLint Airbnb config was fairly simple. We had a, we had a hiccup because we tried to use the Airbnb config specifically for React, but we didn't need to do that because Remix already comes with an ESLint config. But uh, let's go. Let's look at that example. Eleven out of ten. Yeah, just because. Like, I think it really it was it was above and beyond any of the other uh, project generation things that we did. But you'll see it gives you a lot. So this is the generated app that we got. Um, 
And uh, it, it actually did come with an ESLint file. We just went further modified it to add Airbnb in here. Um, someone remind me after we talk about Remux, I'll, I'll talk about, actually, we're already here. I'll talk about Airbnb. People keep asking, <laughs> why what is Airbnb? Uh, it's the Airbnb style guide. So Airbnb is a company that employs software engineers. Those soft, some of those software engineers write JavaScript, and they all came together and wrote a style guide. So if you look up the Airbnb uh, JavaScript style guide, um, it is basically a bunch of guidelines for writing JavaScript code. And then this has been converted into an ESLint config. So if you look at this repo here, for example, arrow functions, they say when you have uh, a, a, an anonymous function paps passed into like a map or a filter, you should use an arrow function. Don't use the function keyword. That is their opinion. And it's really just a pin, an opinion because for the most part, this code would work the same way. Uh, where this code differs is how like the, this binding works. But regardless, they say, write your code like this. And then this has been turned into an ESLint config. And so if you write code like this, you're going to get a little red squiggly that says, hey, you should write it like that. Uh, and they have opinions about a lot of stuff. So if you look at their, their style guide, you can read about all their opinions. And I, I've, been, I've been using their style guide for like seven years at this point, at least. Uh, and so I'm just really used to it, which is why I try to set it up in every app I, I go into, any, every JavaScript app that I go into. Okay, Tailwind setup. Uh, it was already set up, <laughs> 10 out of 10. So when we generated the app, it came with Tailwind. Uh, we've got a Tailwind config. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just ready to go. Uh, component library setup. This was also super easy because we chose Daisy. Uh, we talked about that a little bit ago. Um, but I think we were like, we know it's going to work. Why Why even go through the trouble of adding it? Because I don't think I even have the Daisy plugin in here. But yeah, that was fine. And then social auth, 7 out of 10. So in the Remix ecosystem, there's a library called Remix Auth and Remix Auth Google. Um, and I actually got it all set up in under 30 minutes. So like it, it doesn't come by default with this generated app. Let's talk about this for a second. So the generated app actually comes with its own auth code. So you can look in uh, session to see how they set up the session storage, which is cookie storage. But one of the things I don't like is there's a lot of code in here. Now, that said, like if you start your app from here and you need to go in and change how some of these functions work, you have complete access to it, right? Like this, this is your TypeScript file at this point. You can change it, you can update, you can modify it. But this is also a lot of code in the code base to maintain. And I really like it when an auth library hides all of this stuff from me uh, because then I don't have to maintain that code. So that's one gripe that I did have is like, if you're gonna be implementing uh, like uh, user auth with like username and password, they give you the code pre-generated, but it is a lot of code. So you have like the session code. Um, let's look, what else do we have? Um, Yeah, there's like the login page. It's doing a bunch of like, like obviously you would take this and like do it your preferred way and maybe even like add in some best practices. Like uh, this login function um, is manually validating emails and passwords. Like you probably would pull in a validation library for this. You probably would try to have some sort of like standardized centralized error handling. Cause right now we're doing a 400 status code like within this, like there, there is, all I'm saying is there's a better way to write this, but you do have to maintain that code. So that is one thing. Now, the, all of this login system that it generates is for username and password login. We wanted social auth, which is like OAuth, being able to log in with a, an OAuth provider. And so we just set that up in a separate app because we, we didn't want to mess with all of this generated code. Uh, so we actually have this uh, uh, Google Auth example using the Remix Auth library. Let me double check. That's the name of them, though. So we have Remix. Um, auth and Remix Auth Socials are actually what we what we had. So I, I had that wrong in the slides. It's not Remix Auth Google, it's Remix Auth Socials. But uh, these are community packages, but they work really well. Um, and to add them in requires a few things. Uh, so let's see. We have our auth settings that define our, our user type. We have uh, our session setup very similar to how you're, we were doing username password, but now uh, this uh, auth library will automatically handle those sessions for us. And then uh, we have the auth callback, which is part of the OAuth flow. 
and then we have the actual auth login. So the reason I'm giving this a seven out of 10 is because again, it's still a lot more code. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's not that much code, but it is significantly more than like next auth. So if you've ever configured next auth, it's literally one file handles everything else. I feel like remix auth probably could do that, but it's really probably a matter of opinion of like, do you actually want to hide that from the user? And then once you hide that, you need to make things available by, via the API. And we ran into this uh, like last time we were working with uh, Next Auth. Uh, in certain scenarios, like the API, the API they've provided is is somewhat rigid in that like we want to do something that it isn't making available to us. So if we want to do that, we have to like override internal functions and stuff. Those are the trade offs between like by having it separated out like this, it's probably slightly more customizable than like next auth, but it is a lot more that needs to be set up. So I gave it a seven out of 10. It worked really well once we got it set up. I set this up in under 30 minutes. We were, we generated the remix app, got the OAuth flow going in under 30 minutes. It was pretty nice. Um, and then full stack type safety, seven out of 10. Seven out of ten. Yeah, it is. Re it is React. So Remix uh, is uh, is built on on top top of React, and it's basically a, a full stack framework that uh, uses React internally. So why do I give their full stack type safety a seven out of ten? It's just it's just a little more manual. So like you saw, we, so far we looked at SvelteKit, we looked at Nuxt. Both of those, like the types just flow through. Like there's not a lot of manual code to just get the types going. Here everything is very explicit. And now like. That's typically how it is when you're working in a React code base. Like, there's not much magic. There are not not there aren't many things uh, hidden from you, but that results in more code. Uh, and so for and for this example, like Git post is going to get all the posts from the database, and we have this loader which we specify right next to our component that's actually going to render it out. And then we have this use loader data which is provided by Remix that basically allows us to use that, and then the types types will flow through from here. But if you compare this to like how Nux works or even how SvelteKit works, um, it is a bit more manual. Yeah, and, and I think like Dances with Dirt is saying like, I don't like surprises. It, it's really a matter of opinion, right? The, the thing that I think about is when you have a code base with like, at this point, there's only two sections of the, of the code base, right? You have notes and you have posts. What happens when there's 10, when there's 15, and you're really used to working in this code, now it's just a bunch of boilerplate. Like every single thing you have to set up uh, has that same code. And and honestly, like this isn't a dig on Remix. This is just a dig on how things are in React. Like things are just very manual. Yeah. And like that's also what I'm thinking about. Like as the code base grows, eventually the people working in that code base don't want to have to do the same things over and over and over again, which is where some of that magic comes in. Um, so uh, there's this. And uh, I think if we look at git, git posts, this is in models. And then you could think of the models folder. So they, they generate this folder for you. You could call it whatever you want, because again, it's just TypeScript. You just import the things you need. Um, but I think of this as uh, our, our DAO, our data access layer. So th this, these are essentially data access layer for all of our entities. And this function has, for instance, git posts. But now right now, there's no database. It's just like fake, fake data. Uh, but you could imagine there would be like a Prisma query in here to actually get that data back. Uh, and then this is what's being used in the actual page uh, as a hook here. Now, I do believe that this gives us that magic of initial page load, server side rendered. Uh, if it's a single page application load, it knows to uh, make uh, a, an HTTP request. Um, so that's nice too. But again, it's, it's, just, it's just more code to get it done. All right, in summary, Remix looks really good. Like, it's really production ready. The only, Really, the only gripes I have about it are not even anything to do with Remix. It's the fact that it's like React and there's, it's just things are just more manual in React. You haven't seen the array type in your life? Let's look at it again. Oh. Wait. Array of, wait a second. Isn't it just that? <laughs> I guess technically array you could use as generic too. That's funny. React is React. This is the same thing, right? Talking, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. And welcome in, Terawatt. Glad to have you. OK. Uh, so yeah, Remix. If you like React, you're probably going to like Remix a whole, a whole lot more than, you, than, than, than Next.js. And that's what we're going to talk about next, Next.js. Now, I'm going to go through this really quick because Next.js has been around for a long time. And the things we're evaluating it on, it just it does because it has a pretty mature ecosystem. So project setup, actually, I give it a six out of ten because the it doesn't give you a lot 
and it doesn't ask you any questions. It literally just poops out a, <laughs> a Next.js template. But it doesn't ask you, do you want linting? Do you want Tailwind? It doesn't ask you any of that. It just gives you a, a basic template. Now, uh, if you look through the ecosystem, people have created templates. For example, a, a Create T3 app is a more full-fledged uh, project generator for a Next app. Um, but if you look at the one from the, the core team, it, it's pretty basic, which is why I gave it a 6 out of 10. And then setting up ESLint Airbnb config was the exact same as Remix. I give it a 10 out of 10. Uh, Tailwind, easy. You literally just, in the docs, they tell you how to do it. Easy. Uh, again, component library was easy. We just used Daisy UI at that point. And then social auth was easy <laughs> because things just worked. So we for, specifically for Next.js, we use Next auth. Um, Next auth uh, still exists. So we've been talking about auth.js. This is the one um, that they are basically, actually, does this work with Next.js? I, we didn't even use this one. We, we still use next auth. We didn't try using auth.js with the next module. Um, but eventually, this is going to be where this moves from. So next auth is going to be completely migrated where people will use this instead. Um, but we, we just used next auth. It just worked. Like, I mean, when, if you watched the episode, it was just like, yeah, no surprises. <laughs> like next is really, um, a really mature framework. Uh, and in terms of built-in full stack type safety, I think this is the, the one thing that's completely lacking and I gave it a two out of 10. Uh, and let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, now, of course you may be saying, we'll just use TRPC. Yeah, of course. Like if, if, if you add TRPC, I mean, if you're evaluating TRPC itself, like that's amazing full stack type safety, but without uh, Next.js without that, uh, it's pretty cumbersome. So let me show you what I did. Um, uh, and what I mean by like lots of duplicate code. Okay, so uh, in Next.js, there's this concept of the API folder and this these will be your API routes. So for ex instance, if I had a route that needed to get all the users from the database, that would look like this. So I have this handler that, in this case, we actually did hook it up to auth because we had a, I mean, honestly, this is this is another point about not having to worry about configuration and, and things actually working because we, it was so easy to set up the app, add all the things we needed, even add next auth that we were like, ah, we might as well actually do some authorization. So we actually wrote the code that will uh, send back an unauthorized message if you're not logged in to be able to get back these users. Um, and in the docs, like for whatever reason, you have to use this. I don't, there might be some next experts in the chat. They're like, oh, you don't have to do that. But from what, what I could find, this is what you need to do. Like you need to get the session of the current user that just made the API request. Then you have access to the user to see if they're actually logged in and then you can, you can do the business. So this was a little bit cumbersome, but um, the issue is this is just an API route. So my app slash API slash users will return this JSON data or an unauthorized message. If I want to load this same data on a page, I just have to write the same code. And if you look in the next next docs, they tell you that. So if we look, for example, at our homepage, uh, we have this get server side props. So this is the Next.js way of getting data before server side rendering. And we had to do the same thing. So we had to get the session, but it's like slightly different. And then uh, we had to query the user. So I think you can have middlewares, you can, and we could probably try to figure out a way to share code more easily. But at that point, it's really just like a an architecture decision. Like it's something else we need to figure out. I don't know. Uh, from what I could see, you basically have to duplicate the code. There, there is no way for you to call your API route and get server side props. If you look in the Next.js documentation, they tell you you need to just uh, refactor that code into a reusable function and then call that same function in both places. Uh, in our case, like we probably could have done a slight refactor but we still would need to pass in all of these things separately or like are, they are different depending on where the request is coming from. So built into Next.js is really cumbersome. It's really cumbersome. And then um, I actually don't know how this would handle uh, single page application routing. Like if you went to another page and then you came back, would it actually be able to make turn this into uh, an HTTP request, maybe, but regardless, it's very lacking. Like I said, you could use something like TRPC. And you're gonna have a much better time um, because it's just built in. But again, that's a, that's a separate library. All right. So in summary, Next.js super mature ecosystem. 
it's everything is just very it's even more manual than like in remix for instance um so it doesn't it's only server side rendered okay so that i mean that's that's my my summation of everything um it it's, an, it's a mature ecosystem everything mostly works but it's it's react and so everything is still just like really manual all right in conclusion what am i going to choose and so to, to give you some background on this for those of you that are, that are new here uh today we're starting our friday project so our last friday project was an, an app called fresh spots which is an app that allowed users to uh create and share lists of places to visit so you could create like lists of 10 best restaurants in my city and then like share that list but it showed it on a map that was the last app we built this app we're going to build build today uh, or not today over the next like few months <laughs> i can't scroll because you all are you all are chatting um is an app that will allow users to create share and watch lists of youtube channels so the idea is as a user i can go in i can uh for instance create a list of all my favorite cooking channels so i like to watch the babbage culinary universe you suck at cooking maddie matheson munchies bon appetit um the internet shaquille there's, there's quite a few like cooking channels that I like to watch, but right now on YouTube, all of those videos are just m intermixed with all of the other channels that I'm subscribed to. So I wanna be able to literally create a list of the channels that I wanna see, and then this will create a feed of, um, uh, a feed of videos from those creators. Uh, and then you can take that feed and just share it with anyone else. Um, so you could create, like, I also like to watch skateboarding videos. So there's there's Thrasher and there's Ride and uh, there's like Nike skateboarding and there's a bunch of skateboarding channels, but it'd be nice to just, if I'm in a mood to watch skateboarding, put that, put that list on. So uh, that, <laughs> this is the app that we're going to build. Uh, and and this this is the 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 reason why we were looking into all of these frameworks because we're going to pick one of those frameworks to build this app. Yeah, I'm really building up the suspense. Like, what did I choose? What did I choose? And I'll be honest, the the the, the decision is multifaceted, right? Because <laughs> it goes to an ad break. It's not just like uh like what's the best one? Like, obviously, it has to deal with the ecosystem and. It also is like forward, forward looking, right? So like some of the the, bu the bugs and things that we ran into are going to be fixed eventually. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So that's factored in as well. So in terms of lo longevity, so an app that's at least going to be around for like the next four or five months, what is something we could use that is going to have longevity? And <laughs> please don't disappoint. Actually, I, I, I before I show you my result, I actually want to see how the chat is feeling. Well, what do you think I should have chosen? Uh, so we had Svelte Kit, uh, Nuxt, Remix, and Next.js. You have a minute to vote. What, what, based on my findings, based on everything I just showed you, what would you have chosen? Multi Did I say multifaceted? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm absolutely going to disappoint someone in the chat. Yeah, look at all these Nuxt fans. It's interesting. See, like, Nuxt is kind of amazing, right? There's so much there's so much magic. So much magic. And uh, that's nice. That's nice. Let's take a quick stretch. And then I'll, I'll, reveal, I'll reveal what I'm going to use. <laughs> now, at this point, like, making this poll, like, you all... You watched me do it, but you didn't. You didn't like. You didn't go through all of these frameworks. So like, I have the. I have the. Uh, I was gonna say like post traumatic stress. I don't even know if that makes sense. I I have the experience of trying all of these. So that's where my my decision is, is coming from as well. I know a lot of people are just voting for next because they like React. Um, but yeah. So here's the thing. I f okay, let's let's keep an eye on this. <laughs> so right, right now it says there are 494 people watching. The moment I make my decision, 100 people are just going to leave. But I, I encourage I encourage you to uh, I encourage you to stick around. Um, because uh, it's going to be a good time, and and especially like learning something new, right? Like I choose a thing that you didn't want me to choose, but you can still learn a little bit about it. All right, what did I choose? Spell kit. Spell kit is the answer. Now, now again, let me reiterate and, and let me reiterate why. So we did have issues with the auth library, right? So like auth auth.js, we had some major issues with this. 
major issues with OffJS. <laughs> but there are other options. Um, <laughs> 80% of viewers disappointed. But let so but let me just convince you of of SvelteKit really quick. Um ooh. so first of all, like we didn't even talk about the front end framework itself, right? So like you've got React, you've got Vue, you've got Svelte. Uh, <laughs> how to unsub. Uh you can you can go to your your account settings and then there's like a subscription section and then you can just choose not to renew. But <laughs> right. But um and so here's the here's the other thing to think about from my perspective as well, right? Like I am a content creator, right? Like people uh, watch me to see my opinions on things, and also to like they they watch me to see me try this so that they don't have to try it. Uh, and also like Svelte Kit is very popular right now. Um, that's another another thing that factored into my decision. Um, but even though it is cutting edge, it's production ready, and it comes from a really solid team, right? Like. Um, Rich Harris knows what he's doing. He's a really smart dude, knows what he's doing. And they've they've taken lessons learned from, from Next.js, from, from various other frameworks, and they're, they're doing it right. Now, you could argue that some of the things are a little bit clunky, but I think it's only going to get better. And uh, Zolo, thank you for the resub. Uh, never used it, but always wanted to learn. Nice. Thank you, thank you. Um, so that's the thing. And then um, the other thing is, like, in terms of... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you might be right, Krom. Like, is SvelteKit too new? Because one of the first hurdles we're going to have to get over is implementing auth, because we tried it with auth.js, and it was a little bit broken. We have other options, though. There is this thing called Lucia, uh, which we could get working. We also could just do it do it ourselves, which is, we've done that before. It's not the end of the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, viewers went up. Okay, so people, people didn't leave. <laughs> I said 100 people were going to leave the moment I told you what my decision was. So um, I chose SvelteKit, um, and uh, there's a... I think if I, if I go back in the slides, like, early on in the slides, I talked about... These are the things that I wasn't evaluating all of them on. But if you do, SvelteKit, I think, comes out on top for a lot of these things. It's probably, like, on par with Remix with, like, a little bit more magic sprinkled in. Um... So yeah, <laughs> people heard spell kit from grab their pitchfork. Yeah, um, because like the other cool. So uh, l let's just talk about spell kit for a second. Let me let me justify my decision. So, coding.garden is a very basic website, but this was actually built with spell kit. And one of the nice things is this is a completely static website. This is not running a Node.js instance. I built the app with spell kit, and then I used their adapter called Adapter Static. And it literally took my SvelteKit app and turned it only into a single page page application. Like, there is no server-side process for this because it's a very, very simple app. Um, I, of course, I'm biased. I mean, <laughs> and this is just, like, one little experience I had with SvelteKit. And honestly, I didn't do... Like, somebody made a pull request to my repo that converted the whole thing to SvelteKit, and then I had to go in and change a few things, but... Yeah, I'll show you how I did my slides in just a second. So SvelteKit has some really cool things. Like you can see there's an adapter for Cloudflare, Netlify, Versal, and then there's also adapter static, which if you've written your code in the right way, you can literally just generate static files and host on a CDN. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this this is a this is another thing to bring up. Like there are less jobs in Svelte, so there's no point in learning it as a beginner. I disagree. Like there are more and more companies that are choosing Svelte over something like React. Um, like React obviously is the safe choice, but uh, Svelte does some really cool things, and um, uh, companies are companies are choosing it. Uh, it it's happening. <laughs> I wanted to look at the um, like the state of JS survey from from last year because they they talked they had uh, some stats on like what people were using. Um, so if we look at libraries, um, yeah, like last year, SvelteKit wasn't really even on this list, but it was, Svelte itself was listed here. And if you look at like usage, 20% of respondents were using Svelte last year. I have a feeling if we, so the, the results for 2022 are going to come out pretty soon. I have a feeling, um, it's probably going to be like at least 10% more. There's a lot more people, uh, using, using Svelte. Uh, these days um the recent one is probably uh is it solid 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 start 
Yeah. Is it from two years ago? Because it would have been 2021 released at the beginning of 2022. So I think it's a year ago. This, I, and I, I do agree with that, Pablo. Like, I, I'm, I'm kind of like placing my bets on Svelte Kit, right? Like, I think this will be the year of Svelte. <laughs> uh, what's up, Emil? Welcome in. Um, yeah, you're, you're welcome. Can someone tell me what are the ratings for Svelte? Yeah, I mean, you could also look at, um, so there's experience over time, like would use again, um, and Svelte. I, so like last year it was a little less popular so like that little blue bar there is a little less but you do have people that were interested in it last year but i think that turned into people actually using it this year yeah well i just jump into coding or do modeling the app so that's that's what we're going to do today uh basically so i made my choice i'm sorry if i disappointed you I'll build something with each one of those things eventually. But for now, <laughs> the Friday project is going to use uh, going to use FeltKit. And and I'm not opposed to doing like uh, like a quick four hour stream where I build a single app with Remix or I build a single app with Nuxt, uh, something that's not super complicated. The app that we're going to be building is fairly complicated and it's going to take us a while to do it. So we're going to be using FeltKit for it. But like I said, there'll be one-off streams where I try these other things every now and then. Uh, and if you're just joining us, the thing we're building is an app that allows users to create, share, and list, um, and watch lists of YouTube channels. Yeah. So the choice was SvelteKit. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think I don't even think this is a hot ca hot take, Jonah Codes. It's just like the same thing is happening to React that it happened to jQuery. Um, it's ugly. It's cumbersome. There's just too much of it. <laughs> and thank you, Archon! Exclamation mark merch. Uh, this is this is my shirt. See, it's got the the coding garden logo on it. Uh, and Refot, I think I missed that. Refot Cirk, thank you very much for the uh, the four month resub. And Emil, did I miss that too? My volume's been down. I've been missing so many things. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, Zolo, thank you for the two-month resub. Emil, thank you for the sub. And uh, Refot, thank you for the, the four months. Yeah, Quick City is pretty new, but I it, it, uh, like it. Um, oh, wait, wait. Okay, I'll tell you how I did my presentation real quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw... The, I actually clicked on this today. Um... So I've started doing, I mean, not started. Last week I did a news segment. I'm going to do it again this coming week. I'll probably give like a quick summary of this um, uh, on the news segment on, on Monday. What do you call view if React is ugly? Come on, Terawatt. It's all opinions. <laughs> like, I, f I feel like people that have been writing React for so long at this point, they just have Stockholm Syndrome, right? Like they also don't want to, it's, ha it's hard to admit when you've been using a thing for so long and, and also like you're an expert in that thing, it's a hard to it's hard to see the flaws, right? <laughs> I think that's the scenario with with React. Uh, yeah. So I mainly use uh, JavaScript and TypeScript, but I, I dabble in other things every every now and then. That's called view syndrome. <laughs> Well, the thing is, people are tribal about everything, right? Right, And I think especially because all these front-end frameworks, they have little logos. You can get behind a logo. and a, I, For a lot of people, it's it's their identity. I do not make a front-end framework my identity. I like Vue.js, but it is not who I am. Some people like React, and it is who they are. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's just how people work. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, we, we have an answer to that, Oscar. It is uh, solid. So, so, solid is basically the good React. Um, I guess, like, that, if solid start was in version 1.0 stable, I, honestly, I would have chosen that. I think that's the next thing to look out for, aside from, from Svelkit. Yeah. I worked with Angular a long time ago. I haven't worked with it recently. It's more about you enjoying the creation and maintenance of the project. I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. That's my view. Can I also cover the basics as well? Yeah, absolutely. I will. So I think, honestly, today is just going to be a lot of planning. So um, I think we'll do the initial app setup. So those of you that are interested in SvelteKit, you can see what it's like to generate the app. 
But from there, we need to take a step back and and just talk about what is this app going to do? What are the features? Prioritize those a little bit and then kind of like design the pages that we're going to be designing. Um, so we're not going to write too much about code today because we're really just planning the whole app, really. Yeah. Yeah. Vanilla Man. Yeah, Alka is a vanilla. I mean, you use a little bit of Vue too, don't you? <laughs> Uh, what's up, Cyber Chobo? I, I have a video on my, my YouTube channel called What Programming Language Should I Learn First? There. Click that link. Um, for your question, though, that will help you lead into other languages, um, it's a bit harder to say. I do think, like, if you know, if you learn, you, 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 can, le you can learn anything, especially if you focus on the concepts. Focus on iteration and uh, conditionals and uh, like Boolean logic. And like, basically, like if you focus on the programming concepts and don't focus on the programming language itself, you can absolutely, and most programmers do, go learn other languages. Um, that said, JavaScript has C style syntax. So any of the C style languages, Java, C Sharp, C++, Swift even, um, uh, I think like even like Kotlin, all of those languages uh, were inspired by the syntax of C, just like JavaScript was inspired by the syntax. So if you're talking about syntax, um, you probably could uh, learn JavaScript and still, um, it would be easy enough to learn those other things. But if you look, if you look at that playlist, I have a video that talks about wh what I think your first programming language should be, also based on what you're trying to do with it. I am, yeah, yeah. So this is actually this is another thing, and this is one of the things that I um, was like considering last night, and honestly, one of the reasons that I didn't choose Nuxt, right? So I know a lot of you were disappointed that I didn't choose Nuxt, but um, like obviously Nuxt has that full stack type safety stuff built in, but you potentially also want some kind of data loader, like a like a React query or like a tan stack query, and Nuxt. I do believe their their version of that like is still in beta, um, and there's like a Pina version of that that's like st still in beta. From what I could see, TRPC was kind of like the 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 nicest way I could find. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Cyber Choo Choo Chobo, uh, for the bits. Who says Python uh, confused? Well, I, I think it, I guess it depends on the resources you're learning from. I don't know, like. A lot of people do argue that Python should be your first programming language, um, but one of the arguments I make in that video that I sent you is that with web development technology, so HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, it is so easy to build a thing and then share it with someone else. With Python, it's a little bit trickier. You need to share like Python source code, potentially share an executable. It's, it's tricky um, to share your creations with non-technical people, whereas with web technologies, it's really easy to do that. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> that aside, um, I think we will be using TRPC with Svelte because it looked like the best way to kind of like write out your routes, but also have a good way of querying on the client and on the server. So I think that that's my plan. Next, TRPC or view query. Um, I guess we could have, I don't know. We're going to go with Svelte kit. I don't know. <laughs> That might be the issue, macaroni pizza pie. We're going to be using probably Postgres with Prisma. Um, I um, used to stream on YouTube, and I'm currently a partner on Twitch. And in the uh, partner agreement, it has an exclusivity clause that says uh, I cannot it stream to other services simultaneously. So any content that appears on Twitch cannot appear anywhere else for 24 hours. And uh, pretty much everyone has that same contract. And if they're if they're cross streaming, um, they're just breaking that contract basically. And, or they have a custom contract, but it's probably very unlikely that they have a custom contract. View is great, but I do uh, don't do full full view apps a lot. Yeah. Well, so they removed exclusivity for uh, Instagram and TikTok. But they still, uh, there still is an exclusivity clause uh, limiting uh, YouTube. As far as I know, unless they change that, 
But if you look at the the agreement, it now says you can you can cross stream to TikTok and Instagram, but any platform that's like Twitch, you can't. So you can't do Facebook gaming or um, um, what do you call it? Um, YouTube, <laughs> YouTube Live. <laughs> LightFS and SQLite. Yeah, so, I mean, we're going to use Prisma for the DB. So whatever underlying DB thing we use, uh, we could be agnostic to that, but we might... I like Postgres. There's some features of Postgres that we, we might want to use, which is my why, why we might go with Postgres. Yeah. So this is going to be a full, a full stack project uh, because users need to be able to log in Users need to be able to save their lists of channels to a database. Uh, they need to be able to like like and favorite uh, other lists. Eventually, I don't think this will be part of the MVP or minimum viable product, but eventually it'll be really nice to keep track of users' viewing habits because then we could have like our own recommendation engine that's like a little bit more fine-tuned than YouTube because we're, we're narrowing down to types of channels. Uh, but all of that said, we need a backend. Right? There, there needs to be some backend that's that's holding on, holding on to that information. Yeah. <laughs> Swift. I'm like four minutes behind on chat. Yeah, I agree with that. That was the worst thing that happened to syntax just before the German language. <laughs> oh. How am I gonna do the linter? We're gonna figure it out. We're gonna spend. However long it takes to get the linter working with with SvelteKit. What's my final rankings for each of the frameworks? Um, I'll, sh I'll I'll share this. Let me share this really quick, and also talk about how I did the. Um, uh, how I did my slides. The slides are here under apps and then findings. Um, so you can see the slide deck is just literally just markdown. Um, uh, welcome in, uh, Il uh, Marchis uh, de Carabas. Appreciate that. Appreciate, appreciate that. Um, and then if you look at the package.json, I'm using a thing called reveal MD. Uh, I got some custom options to use a custom theme and then I have some custom styles, uh, but reveal MD. Uh, takes your markdown and turns it into a re reveal JS uh, slideshow. So reveal JS is the is really the thing that's doing the stuff. Um, so if you just want to use re re reveal JS, you could look at it. But reveal MD basically makes it super simple to just create a markdown file and then instantly turn it into a slide deck. And so this is this is what I'm using for that. Um, and then you can see in the actual raw markdown how I'm doing uh, like the fragment. So whenever I, you couldn't see the score that I gave it, but then it showed up. That's because I'm using this class fragment, which actually comes from reveal.js. So uh, any valid HTML is valid markdown. So you can actually just put HTML in your slides. And then now this will um, only show up like with, with the arrow clicking. And then the other thing is I had horizontal and vertical slides. If you do three dashes, that's horizontal slides. If you do four dashes, that is vertical slides. So, slow, show, show. Uh, but uh, look, look at this file if you wanna see my rankings. <laughs> welcome in St. Lolek and Leak Geek, welcome in. Yeah. Yeah, we chose SvelteKit. We're, there's gonna be there's gonna be some hiccups though. Like we get we need to figure out a good auth solution. We need to figure out our linting solution. But we'll we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Okay, I'm way behind. Um, yeah. Oh no, they didn't change it. There are, there are several streamers in this category that uh, unless they have a custom contract, they're 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 doing it. But the thing is, like, in the grand scheme of things, like I'm a really I'm a small creator on <laughs> Twitch. I mean, obviously. I'm doing really well for for the software and engineering category or software and game pro game development category, but I think Twitch really cares if they have like a ten thousand viewer streamer that's doing cross streaming. I don't know. Svelte with MySQL, yeah, absolutely. So ultimately, we're going to use uh, Prisma, and that works with m most SQL databases, and and we're going to be using that inside of SvelteKit. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> if you want to post in the Discord, I could try to help. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm So right now I'm just catching up on chat, and then we're going to get started on planning this project. I always thought Java is the same thing as JavaScript. It's not. Uh, in fact, Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hamster. The only thing they share is the name. <laughs> There's actually no. I mean, honestly, like the syntax is like somewhat close, but that's because they're both inspired by C. Uh, Java is to JavaScript ham hamster. Th this was a, a comic that came out a while back. Well, I mean, this wasn't the comic I was thinking of. Oh, well, it's probably just like an overplayed meme at this point. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're different. They're very different. JavaScript runs in the web browser and also a lot of other places. These days, Java doesn't run in the web browser. It used to be able to via, via applets, but that's not a th I mean, you could probably still get an applet working somehow. It'll be, yeah, I think it'll be similar. I think our, our focus is in the database design, and I'm going to try not to overcomplicate over things, but we are going to spend some time designing the database. Yeah. Yeah, so right now I'm just catching up on chat, and then uh, we're going we're gonna plan, to plan a project. We're going to use SvelteKit, TRPC, Prisma, Postgres. That's our stack. That's our stack. Where do you think ham comes from? <laughs> Pigs. <laughs> what I consider this build to be big, beginner or intermediate. This is more. This is more intermediate. There's a lot of, um, and I would probably say because the number of pages the app is going to have, and because of the complexities of the database schema, I think of this as more of an intermediate project. Um, yeah, that's 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 what I'll say. <laughs> Java servlets in the Spring Framework. Yeah, as far as I know, um, some yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely used more in enterprise. So like larger corporations tend to use Java um, or C sharp. These days, a lot of larger enterprises are reaching for like Node.js and TypeScript stuff, though. Yeah. All right. Oh, and Tailwind. Yeah, add Tailwind to the to the stack. All right. Here we go. How do you protect your IP when using JavaScript outside of WASM or obfuscation? You don't. Uh, if you're writing code that runs on the client, you, you can't protect that. Like, you have to ship that code to the browser. The way you protect your IP is by uh, having your business logic and anything else hidden in, AP, in an API, and that is only available, available uh, via HTTP requests. So the front end is just a dumb client that makes the request to the back end, so your back end has all of the code hidden. Um, yeah, and you said IP. IP is um, intellectual property. But yeah, the, nat the nature of the web browser as an application delivery system means you have to send code to the browser. But you can change where that code exists uh, depending on how you architect the thing. Yeah. Did I come back into Java? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I was saying, like, Java's used in enterprise. Someone literally, uh, the comment they made was like, I always thought... Java and JavaScript are the same thing, so we, we were clearing that up. Um, yeah. All right. Um, let's do the thing. All righty, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you for, for w l watching me do that little presentation thingy. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, let's let's get into it. I think I did, let me just close everything else out, get back into my to-dos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean, clean up my workspace um, here. I remember ActiveX. I remember JavaScript code running in Internet Explorer. Excuse me. Internet Explorer that could access, like, the ActiveX object and all of that. All of that uh, you, could, you could do, like, Windows-specific stuff in IE with JavaScript. Can you tell us why I use Zish now? Because I didn't want to change it. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a new MacBook. Um, wait, is it on the screen too? It is. So I have a new MacBook. And I 
thought because Max come with Zish or Z-S-H now, Z-Shell, I'm going to call it Zish. It's one syllable, Zish. Uh, I just, I'm just using it. Didn't feel like re replacing it with Bash. <laughs> yeah, my wife got me the 14-inch uh, M1 Pro for, for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can look at my stickers. Cool. I'm giving you a second to take all the stickers in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Um, what are we going to do? <sighs> Free debugs? If you see me in a coffee shop, just walk up to me and say, hey, help me with some code. Where is what status bar? Oh, you mean on, on this view? I changed it up. Actually, I want to look at my, uh, my, Twitch, my Twitch thumbnail now. Look, my viewership is up today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it's because I have a little outline. Look at that outline in my thumbnail. How many of you clicked on my stream because I have a little outline? Look at that. Look at that anime. Look when you add the, the little boot. Like, that's... Not me? Okay. <laughs> you didn't notice until right now? Okay. Well, we spent the first five minutes of stream coming up with a gradient to use for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Q Q21 chose the, chose the blue. All right. Let me collect my thoughts. We need to do some initial planning. Now, what does that mean? We need, um, like, probably, like, user stories and... Now, some of you might be averse to Agile and Scrum. We're going to keep it casual, right? So, like, I, I know, I mean, I know I've, I've, I've been a part of projects that we use Agile on and um, uh, used it to plan really big projects. So that's what we're going to do here. This isn't, like, a huge project, but we do want to break things down into stories and then, uh, and then go from there. Um, Oh, I'll have to create some Svelte stickers. I don't have any, though. Yeah. Oh, you clicked on my stream because of the other stream? Nice. Welcome in. Um, <laughs> my work pretends to be agile. Right. I know it can be a sore subject. We're going to do our best to be agile light, right? We're going we're gonna to pick the best pieces that work for us to, to allow us to actually plan this app. Um, so epic user stories are typically, like, the big features. Like, a big feature is, I mean... I, I, you can even start to nitpick this, but I'm going to call a big feature. As a user, I want to be able to log in. That's an epic. It's going to have individual tasks underneath that with like, uh, like the the login page, the logout, the session management, all of that good stuff. Um, there's going to be another epic user story that is like, as a user, I want to be able to to create a list or something like that. And then we'll break that down further into uh, into those stories. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do my I'm gonna do my best, Clicky Poo. It's gonna be slightly casual, but also, I, like I I know from experience that a lot of beginners are really bad at planning and really bad at uh, really bad at like taking this idea in their head and trying to figure out how they're gonna implement it. So I'm gonna do my best to model that uh, in a in a light way light way possible. Okay, <laughs> okay. So we'll have our epic user stories. Um, we'll do that first, and then. I think from there we can start to um, design the initial um, pages, depending on uh, which epics we, we we decide to work for first. Uh, yeah, so every stream will be uploaded 24 hours later to uh, the archive channel over here. OK, we'll design some pages. Um, We'll also need to design the, the database. Now, as, as we go, our schema will probably evolve as we like discover new functionality that we need and stuff like that. But it is, I, I believe, and a lot of other people do too, <laughs> that up front, you definitely want to have a good high level view of all the entities and all, all the data and stuff that's going to be involved in your app. So we're going to do some, some database design from there. Um, and then we could go into the uh, initial setup. 
Uh, are we going to do daily stand-ups? No, but we could start every stream with a recap, right? Basically, that's our stand-up. We talk about what we did last time and then what we're going to do today. Uh, I haven't decided that yet, yet Code Brains. Like, that's something we're going to have to figure out when we get there. Um, I think we're probably going to try to use Lucia. Any blockers so far? Off. And ESLint <laughs> are blockers. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's the other thing is like if we really want to do this scrum style, like we need to have a sprint that's, I mean, maybe a sprint can be two streams and every two streams we deploy and we also have a, a retro. I don't know. I, I also want to avoid being too rigid about this, right? Like we still want to have fun. <laughs> we still want to have fun. Um, and it's it's hard to do sprints if we're only working on it one day a week. Is is all I'm saying? Is, is all about why I'm saying that? I don't think Passport can integrate with anything that's not Express. And I don't think SpeltKit is Express. We could look into it though. Yeah, I don't I don't plan on writing any tests. If anything, we could do uh, end to end tests. So like probably like Cypress. Maybe we'll do that. Do I need to do my DevOps thing? Honestly, that would be cool. Like. Okay, let's think about this, the Shibas. Uh, uh, would you be opposed to coming on stream? It would probably be like, honestly, three weeks from now because we have all this upfront planning and then I'm actually gonna be gone for a week, but we could have you on and you could help me dockerize it. What do you think? Is that crazy or you just wanna make a pull request? If you just wanna make a pull request, that's fine too. <laughs> Twitch guest. <laughs> so we joked about this last time, just because like, I, I know some of you are new here, you haven't seen everything that I've said, but um, we did try AuthJS and um, uh, it's broken. It's broken right now. There, there's, it's, it doesn't work. But we, we talked about this last time. It's like when somebody comes into the Twitch chat, it's almost like clippy. It's like, have you tried doing this? And we're like, yes, we tried. We spent hours on it and, and it's broken. Um, no, no, it's no worries. I think I think it's funny when I see it. <laughs> and and like uh, no like no dig against them. Like they're they're figuring it out. It's still it's still technically experimental. It's not it doesn't even have a stable release yet. Um, we ran into some issues, especially with Google Google OAuth. Okay, let's 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 do some initial planning. Um, need to take a vacation from work. Uh, not opposed to it at all, just want to make sure I have the time. Yeah, and, I, and then like I said, it would probably be like three, four weeks out, so um, you'd know ahead of time. But um, I'll, mess I'll message you on Discord. So it looks like you're trying to set up off, yeah. <laughs> um, what should I use for my project board? Now, I, I like to use Trello. I like to use Trello, but every time I use Trello, everyone in the chat is like, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Why aren't you using this? Why are you using Trello? Um, I like Trello. Let me let me log in really quick. Have you tried Trello? <laughs> so if we start with GitHub projects from the beginning, it might be all right. Yeah, some people do mention Notion. I'll have to look at Aura. Um. Obsidian Obsidian is like a like a local thing, right? Like with markdown file. Okay. Notion project management. Notion for project management. Cool. Um we might honestly use GitHub issues. I'm new to it, so it's going to take some learning. I mean, I would be new to all of these things, which is why I always just reach for Trello because I know that it works. But yeah, <laughs> linear app. Now, at this point, it's going to be how to choose a project management tool. We're going to set a 30 minute timer. I'm not going to spend more than 30 minutes figuring out a way to manage this project. We're just going to go from there. I mean, honestly, 15 minutes at the most. But 
this is the time for you to suggest things, and, and I'll take a, a cursory look at them before I, before I jump in. Um, we could, I don't have like a whiteboard that I can point at. There is that, um, what is that app? Is it Miro? That's basically like a digital whiteboard, yes. So this actually does have project management too. So that's an option. Um, <laughs> spreadsheets? <laughs> Yeah, it'll be it'll be public. Um, though, I think that I think that's another uh, that's another aspect. People need to be able to look at the project board uh, as view only. Um, they shouldn't be able to edit it, but people should be able to see what what tasks are completed, what's upcoming, that kind of thing. Um, click up one app to replace them all. Monday.com. Platform built for a new way of working. Oh, goodness. Millanote. The tool for organizing creative projects. Excaladraw. What is it, Aura? Task management done right. Oh, yeah, the... I mean, honestly, we could use Jira. I think that Jira does have a free tier, don't they? We could use Jira. Though, can I make a read-only board that anybody can see on Jira? And then what's the what's the other one that uh, I think it starts with like an O? Uh, th this is the project idea, Jira. <laughs> um, Asana, that's the one. Obsidian is like I, I I always saw Obsidian as a markdown editor. Do they have project management features? Yeah, I mean, so th this is one of the things I like about Trello. I can make it so that I, I can share the link with anyone and they can see it, but they don't have edit access to it. I'm not sure if that's the case with all of these. And then GitHub projects would also be the other scenario where like this is an open source project, so anyone can see the project page. Um. Did I already open ClickUp? I did. Yeah. I'm also trying to avoid people asking me why am I using Trello? Because <laughs> every single time, someone's like, why, why are you using Trello? I don't know. Um, I guess linear, I, had, I see a lot of people praising linear. Oh, is this like the, the notion killer? Unlimited members. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Okay. Honestly, I'd, I would I would try logging in with Linear really quick to see what they got. Um, who? Wait, what? <laughs> Asana with an A? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't even see I didn't even see Asana from uh, Sword Art Online. That's not Asana though. But maybe that's not, that's what that's what uh that's maybe that's not what I that's maybe that's what they thought. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. I'm sorry for the random anime girl. Um, that could have been bad. Uh, Kanban for Obsidian. Yeah. GitHub Actions, uh, GitLab Projects, yeah. <laughs> I think I think you're totally right, Mark. Um, all right, but honestly, several people had like rave reviews for Linear, so uh, let's sign up and see what they give us. I mean, I think I think you're all right. GitHub Projects is probably the way to go. I just need to learn it and get used to it. There there are things about it that I that are that I don't like that feel rigid, but yeah, let me let me log in. Yeah, my, the Trello clone, clone I make is not full featured. Um, We'll go here. I got a really cool URL, linear.app slash coding dash garden. Uh, dark theme, yep. Command menu, all right. 
I'll do this later. Linear links the issue in the GitHub pull request automatically. Linear syncs the issue status when a pull request is open. Linear will not ask for code read permissions. Mm -hmm. Open linear. <laughs> Did you see that page animation? Who does that? Who does that? That was really cool. All right. Um, so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, at least we got in. Um, let's add a new project. We're going to call this the Friday project. We're try so we're, we have nine minutes left to pick a, a project management tool. Do it again. I think I'll try. If I just refresh, um, then uh, it'll do it. But it didn't do it. It didn't do it. But it, like, zoomed out or zoomed in. Um, I think it was just part of the onboarding process. New issue. As a user, I want to log in. Now, I'm also, I don't think I'm even gonna get, uh, is pedantic the right word? I'm not gonna get super specific about, about writing good user stories, because that's another thing you could spend a whole lot of time doing. Like you could talk about, well, the, it needs to be from the user's perspective. Does the user actually wanna log in, or does the user want to be able to have lists that they can control. And what does that mean? That means that they can log in. I, I'm not going to worry about <laughs> writing, writing good user stories, but let's see. All right, now that I have an issue, can I have a board? Um, oh, okay, this, this is nice. Can I share this with people? When is it done? Yeah, so we would also have like acceptance criteria. Uh, we could add a label that's like uh, epic. It looks really cool. Yeah, I mean, this is, I don't try new things often. This is pretty slick. All right, let me figure out how can I share this project. There's a link icon in the top right. When I'm here? You can see me like squinting like this though. The, the text size is a little bit small for me. Hmm. Is it invite people? I don't want to have to add them by email. All right, when I'm on the board. Yeah, that's the main issue is I don't want to add everyone's email. I want to give you all a link so that you can see this. Try the board hamburger menu. Copy paste the URL. You have to log in. You all tell me. I think if you if think if you all click that link, um, it's gonna say you don't have access to it. I don't want anyone to contribute. I want anyone to be able to view it. Copy link. Project URL copied to clipboard. I guess I don't like that people have to log in just to view the board. Even I guess even if even if I got it working, no access. Oh, you create a view that anyone can have access to. What a concept. So call this the public view. Uh, I don't rollerblader, but what I want to do is, like, it won't be specific to a smartwatch, but Gadget Bridge makes all of the health data available to other apps on the phone. So it would be cool to have, like, a heart rate monitor that shows, like, on the screen or something like that. Um, edit view, share with all, share with all teams, save.
Yeah. Um. Copy view URL? This one here? Copy view URL. And then it says it's not found probably because I'm not logged in here. Because right now I can only say share with all teams or private. Yeah. Okay. So linear, honestly, it looks really cool. And they're, if you looked at their, their pricing, uh, it's free for, I don't know, it's, it's cool. <laughs> but um, honestly, I think we're just going to go with GitHub projects because everyone can access it. Right. So th those are our two options, right? GitHub projects or Trello. I think it's time. Yeah, you get up to 250 issues. You'll never have more than 250 issues, right? Right? All right, we use GitHub projects. But that means, so here's the tricky part. We need a name. <laughs> we need a name for this app. We're going to spend an hour naming the app. Um, my heart rate right now, I'll take it, I'll take it really quick. My average heart rate is uh, 78, 73. Narrator, he did have more than 250 issues. <laughs> no, 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 73, not 173. 84. It says I'm relaxed, but I feel like I was talking. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, ChatGPT is really good for brand ideation. Let's do that too. So, but okay, so we, we have, we, I mean, honestly, if you're new here, this is basically how things go. We, we keep going down rabbit holes. So ultimately we made our choice. We're going to use GitHub issues, but if we're going to use GitHub issues, we need to create a GitHub repo and a GitHub project, and we need to put a name on it. So to put a name on it, we need to come up with a name. That's where we're at. Um, so we're going to ask ChatGPT. Um, I, here's the thing. I've thought of some names. So, and here's, here's like kind of like the elevator pitch for this. Think of the users of the app as curators, curators. Does everyone know what I mean when I say curator? They, they make curated content. They are curating. Did I spell that right? So um, the users of the app are curators, which these days we have content creators. These are gonna be content curators. So they are curating lists of YouTube channels. And the idea is like eventually, yeah, like a museum curator, they are, cu they are curating the things in the museum. In this case, you are curating the things in, uh, or the channels that will be on uh, any of these given lists. But here's the thing. Eventually, we can also have like lists of Instagram accounts, right? We could have lists of subreddits, uh, lists of Reddit users. We could have uh, like Spotify, it's like music lists. Right? So eventually the same content curation could expand out to other platforms that have content on them. Um, so if we go generic, right? Like, cause I, a lot of people last time were suggesting like um, your tube. That's, that's clever, but it's also, we might get a cease and desist from YouTube <laughs> cause it's YouTube. Uh, so like I was thinking um, like Curi Curio uh, curator. Uh, I was also thinking of like list with a D listed. Um, I was also thinking like, what if we do something? Okay. Uh, I was thinking about this last night. It's probably a horrible idea, but what if we, so list cat, um, curio box, cur curator, curator. Curated. Something with farmer. We could go coding garden theme. Yeah. Um, curator. List pot. <laughs> I like all the all the new users are coming in with with suggestions. I, so I, I missed a bunch of suggestions. If uh, if I missed your suggestion, definitely say it again. Honestly, do, do this so it's easier for me to see. Uh, do, uh, in the chat, do exclamation mark submit. Um, 
your 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 submission or not not submit submit like that uh, and then it, that's gonna show up over here so I don't lose it <laughs> like that um, listify excavator wait what are we excavating <laughs> But so my idea with ListCat, so I looked into, I looked up ListCat. ListCat is like some IBM thing. Um, but what if everything was cat themed? So it's called ListCat, but like our logo is just a cat. And like you have like little cute cats all over the website. Um, choose a simple English word. As a foreign speaker, curator sounds weird to me. And that's what I was thinking. It's like you kind of like... Cu Curator, curated, curating is not a common English word. It's not, it's not, yeah, Meower, that's an app that I built. All right, let's see what else other people were doing. So we've got um, a lot. Uh, keeper. I like keeper. So like you are the keeper of your, of your lists and such. Unless you work in a Zim museum, you pro you've probably never heard the term curator. Garden spot, curator. Uh, I do like, the thing is like, uh, curio, that's the other thing is we, we need to make sure that these things don't exist yet, but like curio, um, could be good. Curcumber? Curate it? Exerts? Fresh lists? <laughs> the thing is, if you search the web for curio, what do you find? Uh, journalism narrated. It's apparently a thing. We handpick content from leading publications. Um, my feed. Pizza. Cura list. Garden spot. Curator. Listerer. Sommelier? <laughs> like like uh, the wine person? Listnip. <laughs> um, it it kind of sounds uh, not safe for work. <laughs> um, I like, I like, which one's 3071? Jeez. Okay, give me a second. I need to, um, I need to be able to moderate this. <clears throat> What am I doing? Oh yeah, I, I need it. I need an API key. Where are we at with the application? We're coming, we're coming up with a name. I mean, I feel like it's par for the course. Like we get on so so many tangents. But here's the thing: when we write code, it's pretty good. I think, anyways. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at writing code. I think that's why people stick around. Names are important. Here we go. <sighs> Seed Vault. Curacious. I kind of like, like, either with a Q or a K. Um, like, keeper, curator. Like this. 60% <laughs> must, mustache, 20% rabbit holes, 20% coding. Or, yeah, okay. Does that add up to 100? Um, all right, we're going we're gonna to time box it. We now have three minutes to choose a name. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get my 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 last ones here. Um, so I kind of like list cat just because it could be cat themed, but we'll see. Listed is cool. Curator. I think I think again we're getting into the area where people don't know the word. Uh, keeper keeper of lists. Curio. I think I think this is where we're at. Um, curate. I think that could work because it's almost like you're rating it's but you're not really rating channels. Um yeah, I mean I guess you are if you're if you're picking which one should actually show up in a list. The name should wait until the idea grows on us, but we have to create a GitHub repo and we have to create a folder for for our project. So we have to I guess we could always go back and name it. Um Yeah, I kind of like Curio. Let's 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 do some domain hunting. Now, I'm going to hope that you all don't try to snipe these domains. I mean, if you snipe the domain, I'll just choose a different domain. I, I'm not locked into anything yet. Um, my Curio dot app. Playing all the domains right now. <laughs> Live domain hunting. This is this is this is, tr is a tricky game to play. Um, <laughs> you're gonna buy it. Um, here, Nate. I, I really like Namecheap. They're my they're my preferred domain seller. Uh, we can go into like short domains. Curio is a school in the Netherlands. Dot list. I don't think it's a TLD. Um, list dot list. Yeah, it says invalid. So this will say invalid if it doesn't exist. And then um, it'll say unsupported if you have to buy it somewhere else. Curio? It's only $30,000. <laughs> um, the other thing we could do is we could add like multiple eyes. So like Curio with two eyes. Or like Curio. <laughs> pocket pocket change. <laughs> Wait, curio dot pet. So if it, if it's loading, that means it's taken. Uh, pet isn't a valid. Well, it it is valid, but they don't sell it here on Namecheap. I kind of do like listed. Um, what's cat? Well, see, cat is uh, Catalina. And they have requirements. So the, the other site I use for like international domains is Gandhi.net. And um, they'll tell you the requirements. We spent all our budget on our domain. <laughs> um, so uh, the registration uh, requires that you publish at least one page in Catalan or Catalan within six months because it's uh, Cat Catal Catalan. It's not it's not available anyways. Um, what's up, uh, Abogung? Is that available? Cure. But then people are going to... Here's what you have to think about. Like, people are going to call it Kurge. Right? Kurge? <laughs> I want to access in Catalan. Or Catalan, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a game, but it also is like these days. It, I don't it doesn't necessarily have to be a game because it is GG, like good game. Um, Curry.io is it? Listify, MyTube. Kind of like listed. The thing is, so, uh, so earlier I was talking about um, um, all of the other things. Did I get rid of it? Oh, well, I got rid of it. But the fact that this could go from being just YouTube. Listy? For, I mean, does Germany have the same requirement? Listify. That has to be a thing, right? <laughs> $100,000. <000. laughs> 
<laughs> Listed without the I. It does look like, look like an STD. Uh, Pandahunting.org? <laughs> concur. Content curation. Do you concur? Does anyone know that, that reference? I think it's from um, uh, Catch Me If You Can. Thomas, what, uh, what seems to be the problem? Bicycle accident, fractured tibia about five inches below the toe. Hmm. Dr. Harris. Yes? Do you concur? Concur with what, sir? With what Dr. Ashland just said. Do you, do you concur? Uh, well, it was a bicycle accident. Um, the boy told us. So you concur? <laughs> do you concur? I'm not going to play the whole thing, but then he like walks away. He's like, I should have concurred. Um, but in the, if you don't know that movie, Leonardo DiCaprio, DiCaprio actually wasn't a doctor. He just pretended to be, which is why he had no idea what he was talking about. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> listed. Listed. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to listed.io. I think the main issue is like listed.com is taken. Like all of the big ones are taken. So like if somebody doesn't know that they need to go to .io or dot .app. Uh, thank you for the raid. Who's that? Uh, PS Halog. Thank you very much. What were you working on? Um, HTML and CSS, SIMD JavaScript. Nice. Uh, were you speak? Were you streaming in German too? Welcome, man. Glad to have you. We are right now trying to name an app, which is one really hard thing to do. <laughs> do you concur? Um, cure. Trying to learn JavaScript, nice. Listagram? That's not German. Well, their their bio was in German, wasn't it? Elbit Birgun. Uh, I don't know, maybe, is that Belgian? I don't, I don't know. What was the fun that I, the one that I just found? Unless somebody just bought it. Oh, Listed TV. The, the only reason I hesitate is because this could be expanded beyond TV. But I guess if we uh, we could if we branch out, then we add other do domains. Let's see what short ones are available for listed. Listed .dev. GDN typically stands for global domain name. Not people. Not many people know that though. Um, I don't, yeah, listed.app is not available, registered in 2018. Excuse me. I do agree multiple TLDs would be too confusing. Listed online? Listed one. We're spending too long on this, but I kind of want to buy on domain right now. <laughs> Listed dot top? Listed top. The, f the thing is, like, if we use one of these things that's not a dot com or dot, not a dot io, I kind of want it to be a part of the uh, part of the app name. Uh, I cannot read that. Code Looper, thank you for the prime. Much appreciated. Conservature. Why is everything so expensive? Uh, because they're short words. Really, any any of the shortest words um, are usually taken. Let's see if listed.me is taken. And uh, thank you for the prime, uh, PS 
Uh, hello. Much appreciated. You're both brand new. Thank you. You're <laughs> too kind. <clears throat> Google.com is taken. Dang. Somebody got... I was about... So... I was about to just buy listed.xyz. Listed.coding.garden? Did somebody buy that today? <laughs> listed.null.computer? Uh, we can also go by like audio video. Let's see. Listed one. <laughs> oh, you're right. We are, it is 2023. They bought it last year. <laughs> uh, listed FM, listed live. Listed media. Yeah, so you know, the other thing that this reminds me of, I don't know if you all have used this, is an app called uh, Letterboxd. Uh, this, act this, this is actually uh, really cool for discovering new movies that's, and it's not like algorithm based because people just create list. Um, so on Letterboxd, uh, uh, there are like lists of music movies, like visually insane, sight and sound, greatest films, Letterbox, 1 million watch club. Also there's a, <laughs> there's actually a really funny joke on here. Um, when, uh, like cr Christmas movies, but it's actually kind of insane that, um, so you, you can see the pattern here, that there's a lot of Christmas movies where there is a white heterosexual couple wearing red and green on the cover. And so there's literally a list that is white heterosexual couples <laughs> for Christmas movies. Um, let's find it. Listed.me is viable? No way. I don't know about that. Um, that's a bike, that's a bike, that's a bike. Done. Oh, there's another bike. That's another bike. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> no, I, don't, I wouldn't go with it anyways, I just wanna see. I like, but I think the, the, the thing is, like, when it comes down to branding, right? Buy it before I do. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll have to find the list at some point because it's kind of, it's just hilarious that somebody made the list because they found all the movie posters that, that had that. Okay. Um, list box. Listbox.com is taken. Listbox.org. This box that I <laughs> All right, I'm gonna buy a domain right now, but I'm not gonna tell you which one I'm gonna buy. Um, oh, you found it, you found it? <laughs> I, I'll just show this really quick. Christmas movie posters with white heterosexual couples wearing red and green. I think like some of them are not loading for some reason. I have my, my ad blocker on, let's see. Um, Look at all these Christmas movies. And there's two there's two pages of it. Um How are you gonna do a full screen ad like that? That was there's a reason I'm using an ad blocker. That's crazy. There was no way for me to get out of that ad. Okay. But yeah, letterbox is kind of this is the list of we're basically building letterbox but for YouTube channels. Um <laughs> Alright. Alright, I'm gonna go buy a domain. Uh was I didn't well I didn't want to click close because that was a part of the ad and if I clicked that, I I know, um, yeah. All right, the thing is I got sidetracked with Listbox because I kind of like Listbox. That's a working button. <laughs>
Is box a TLD? It's unsupported on Namecheap. What even is the box TLD? Do you concur? <laughs> but do you concur? <laughs> um, I can't. I can't find a website where I can get the uh, box uh, domain name. One hundred one domains dot com. I guess you can get it on name dot com. All of the, the box... Oh, it's not out yet. I see. All of the searches are weird because it's like you search for it, but then it just puts the word box onto the thing you searched for. All right. I need to make a decision right now. So here's what I'm going to do. I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. Who's paying for a pizza domain? <clears throat> let me let me just log in really quick so I can just buy this thing. Um, I know I could make a subdomain, but I also like I I want I want um what am I saying? <laughs> I want to have the branding because I, I honestly, I think this is a good app idea. I think, um, yeah, I think it's a good app idea. So I want to have good branding. You thought of this app idea last night? Nice. Yeah. First rule of development, buy a domain first. <laughs> um, List keeps. List keeps. That's the other thing you have to think about, right? So, like, if this becomes the next hot media platform, what are people going to say, right? So, like, TikTok, really easy to say, two syllables, makes sense. Uh, YouTube, I mean, it's from an older era. Like, YouTube is like a Web 2.0 name, but it's been around for so long. Twitch. And then... I agree. TikTok is hard to spell. I always I spell I always spell it wrong. All right. Um, List talk? Oh, Twitter is another one. Twitter is another like web point web web two point oh name. Teach talk? Huh. Plick pluck? <laughs> like I think like Lister. That's that's that is one thing. Um I didn't look into. List talk. We're gonna get sued if we do that. Okay, listtalk.com is taken. <laughs> I have lists. <laughs> Wait, 
Wait, is that the right thing? Your curatocracy? <laughs> Wait, what? List me if you can. All right, I'm going to run a poll. I'll see what you all think. I still, I'm just going to choose what I think, but I'll, um, um, vote now. Which one of these should I get? We've got listed.media, listed.me, listbox.media, and listbox.io. Which one? <laughs> this must be the only channel that encourages posting links. You're not wrong. Why does it have to be list? Uh, it's just the name. that I, I like it the most because it's like, it's also kind of meta because we've talked about how everything are lists. Everything is, everything's lists, lists of lists of lists. Me have list, you have list, we show list. <laughs> I'm a list, you're a list, she's a list, so we're all lists, yeah. Not the IO? It won 62 votes for listbox.io. I think list list box comes off it rolls off the tongue, right? Uh, but it's like also I didn't I didn't even Google list box. Is list box a thing? List box is a class in window in WinForms. Listbox.com is email marketing. <laughs> they're they're already a company. I didn't even I didn't even think to look. Yeah, I agree. Like yeah, listed media. It just seems like it's over, like, um, um, listed. I do realize that the, the word, the, the word STD is now in the name. I didn't even think, I didn't think about that. Should we do list with a Y instead of an I? I'm literally about to buy a domain. All right, I, I think I gotta go. I gotta go with this. This is it. Yeah, they both have domain privacy. Good. You want to make sure that that happens so I don't get doxed. <laughs> buy them all. It says I got it. Cool. Nice. I bought it. Let me log out of this account so I don't dox myself. <laughs> One hour later. No, the domains are mine now. Um, and I'll tell you which ones I, I bought later because I want the DNS to be able to resolve. Because if you go there now, then the DNS is going to get cached and then... Uh, will have issues. Don't go to those domains. Any, any of those domains I listed, don't go there. <laughs> Content garden. I'm trying to keep it less like coding garden themed. Yeah. Um, like you have to guess how it's spelled. True. True. Because if you don't know how it's spelled and like somebody tells you to go there, uh, you don't know what to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's make a GitHub repo. <laughs> so... 
So we know that the base name is listed. Uh, I, I didn't go with list box just because it was taken. Um, so listed. I'm just going to create a repo under coding garden called listed. I haven't looked at carbon components, no. OK, so we got a GitHub repo. Great. Um, we want to add a project to it, a new project. List D. It does sound like a Linux daemon. Um, I was. I guess I didn't even. I didn't even search Google for listed. Listed.com is a cloud-based home buying search engine. <laughs> um, new project. I want a board. Uh, backlog ready in progress. Iteration one, I think we want this. Backlog ready in progress. Not ready, working on? This one. Okay, I'll tell you because it actually doesn't matter. I bought both uh, listed.me, so this will be the easy way to get there. But we're going to call it listed media. So like me is short, shorter than media, so you can get there by going to listed.me, but you'll also be able to get there by, via listed.media. And then I think we'll just call the thing listed media. Yeah, it's a good short URL, I think. Look at that, I own that, that's mine. <laughs> and then, um, that's smart, yeah, yeah, right? You, 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 like, you like what I came up with, cool. Smart. <laughs> and the other thing is if we call ourselves listed media, then we're not gonna get confused with listed.com. I spent $13 for those two domains, so not bad. Listed by me, exactly, like people, and that's the other cool thing is like listed.me slash skateboarding, and then it's a list of skateboarding YouTube channels. <laughs> that's why CJ is the streamer and we're the chat. <laughs> nice, okay, so we have ourselves a project, awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the name. I think I've gotten some good responses in the chat. People are, people are happy with the name too. Um, and thank you to whoever, so whatever, for whatever reason, um, uh, listed.me wasn't loading on Namecheap, so I thought it was taken. Um, and see you later, uh, Caligula. Thank, thank you for hanging out. Um, I concur. Great. <laughs> like, this wasn't showing up on Namecheap, so I thought it was taken, but apparently it was available. I, I got it after a while. And then, like I said, like these, it's listed media, but listed.me is the short one. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, if the project fails, we'll just turn this into a URL shortener. I think that's that's the idea. <laughs> All right, um, I know there are a lot of programmers and coders here, so I think we're actually we're just gonna we're gonna do the the initial app setup, install Prisma, and then design um, the initial database schema. Because I do want to leave in about an hour, um, so I'm not gonna bore you with user stories and page design. We'll do that next time. Right now, we're going to just think through all of the data. I will say that typically, um, it is nice to come up with your epic stories, because that informs what pages are going to exist and what data is going to exist. But um, uh, social <laughs> socialist. <laughs> That's funny, because it's like it's, it is a socialist. Boredom next time. I'll remember. I mean, I'll see you. I'm a program. What's up, Robert Tables? Uh, and shouts out to Robert Tables. Definitely, definitely click that link, drop a follow. Um, uh, people, I mean, I was assume that you're watching because you want to see that. Um, yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. Code with Code with Benji. Like coming up with the user stories defines what we're going to be doing, which informs the data. Now we already know the overarching idea here, which is like lists of channels. And really, I mean, I have the idea in my head, right? Like, and, and that's the main reason we come up with user stories and the main reason we design these pages is the ideas I have in my head may be completely different than what you all are thinking about. And I mean, I guess in this case, you all are my teammates because you're, you're providing feedback on as I build it. So it's like, I need to be able to convey the things that I'm doing to you in some way. Um, as a user, I like clicking buttons of all types. <laughs> All right, let's come, honestly, we'll, we'll, do, we'll time box it, all right? So we're going to do 15 minutes of epic stories. 
uh, 15 minutes of some basic wireframing, and then 30 minutes of database design. That's what we're going to do. Here we go. Um, so and then 30 minutes of database design. Um, oh, you might be right. Let's, let's look at the project settings. Private, public, there you go. We didn't even use chat GPT. Okay, easy. Um, all right, 15 minute timer. Let's come up with some epic stories. And I guess I'll give a, a, a bit of background if you don't know what uh, user stories are. So the, the concept does come from Agile. Um, and it's it's basically, well, no, I want to show, for, uh, no, 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 no. List GPT, did I say list GPT? <laughs> So in, uh, in software development and project management, a user story is an informal, natural language description of features of a software system. Now, you can get really, really picky about these user stories in terms of like the language that you use and um, how they're written. Like typically, a good user story is written from the perspective of the end user. And, and Agile tries to be end user focused because at the end of the day, the software that, that we're building is for users. It's not for the developers. It's not for the project managers. It's really, it's not for the company. It's for the users that are um, actually using the app. Yeah, so in, in like user interface design, uh, in, I'm sorry, like uh, user experience design, they also talk about like personas. So like how, let, let's imagine um, you've got a, a 30 year old man that's single and he likes skateboarding. So that's one persona. And then you try to think about like, oh, how would they use the app? User stories, you can, you sort of do that as well. Like you come up with your various user roles. Actually, that's one thing we can, we can brainstorm really quick uh, because all of the user stories need to be written from the perspective of a given user role. Um, so typically what you do is you come up with your, your <laughs> user role. Hey, we try to keep it safe for work here. Um, so things like, uh, a a not logged in user. We I guess we could call like a casual user. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, VP user story. Wait, vice president of user stories. I guess yeah. So like a not logging somebody who like doesn't have an account on the website and they just want to go watch a list that somebody else created. Um, let's call those uh, a guess. So. As a guest, I want to be able to watch a list without logging in. That's an example of, of like a user user role, an unauthenticated user. And the thing is, like you typically try to use non-technical language. Like in and, and typically like you don't use developer as a user role. Now, like I said earlier, we're gonna be real casual with it. I'm not gonna spend too much time being like super specific about, oh, that's not a good user role versus what is. Uh, because honestly, we are we are I mean, I'm a developer and I'm the one working on this. So as a developer, I want a database schema. That, though, if you, if you know anything about good user stories and good user roles, that's not a good one because it's not written from the perspective of a user. It is written from the perspective of a developer. Um, and typically, I don't write those things as user stories. I, I write those as chores or tasks. So instead of a user story, it's literally... <laughs> uh, instead of a user story, it's just... Uh, a, a chore that says set up database or designs database schema. It's interesting that someone with no access is called a guest, but the tourism industry, a guest is treated very differently. Because, yeah, I mean, people, technically authorized people are guests. That is interesting to think about, yeah. A lurker. Yeah, you, we, basically, you all know what I mean. Like a guest, uh, casual, not logged in, a lurker. Okay, uh, what are some other roles that would use this website? We got like two minutes to come up with one. Honestly, visitor. Visitor is probably the best one. Good, good call. Uh, just seven stars. Um, someone who is not logged in. And really, we know what we mean by that, but we just want to convey that in our user stories. This is somebody that is unauthenticated. Yeah. But from a non-technical perspective. Um, so as a list creator. So uh, list creator, manager... Curator, again, I think if we use the, the word curator, uh, 
we're going to lose people where English isn't their first language. So I probably would just be creator or manager. So yeah, a person that creates lists uh, for to, for people to watch. Um, the CEO of HTML. <laughs> Yeah, and so you could think about uh, do will in this system will we have a super admin? Like, will there be like a god view that the super admin can log into to see the users in the system? Um, those kinds of things. I I don't think those are core features we need early on, but you could you could call it. We could add it like super admin because the the other idea about coming up with all of these. Uh, in, in a second, coming up with these stories is that they can be prioritized. So we don't have to do all of them today, but we, it's almost like we're ideating and we can work on them later. Um, the manager manager, I might lose it. <laughs> a lister, nice, I like it. Um, like we, we, could, we could come up with like our own like domain lingo, right? So on, list, on listed media, you're a lister <laughs> in a listy. Um, from linear require login to see yeah and that's the thing is i don't i don't want to require login right so like j just like anyone can go to youtube without logging in you should be able to go here and not log in um yeah is a curator something specific for museum that's typically where the term is used but i think it could be applied to this scenario because you are a curator of youtube channels um actually no this is actually uh i didn't think about this nesby but yeah so what here's here's the here's the other thing um a content creator or like a uh, YouTube channel owner, right? Think about this. What if you log into the app and if you have your own YouTube channel, you can get analytics about all of the uh, various users that have added your channel to lists, right? Like then, then things get super interesting because um, that also can become like a discovery tool because you can see other channels that are like you and then you can see what kind of content are they publishing and that could give you ideas about your own content. So like this is a whole different uh, way of attacking the problem. Whereas like we're really thinking about this from the, the consumers of the media, but you also have to think about the ones creating the media and they, they could benefit from this app as well. So. That's definitely a thing. Um, yeah. Enlisted. Yeah. Yeah. Lister? Moderator? <laughs> yeah. And so eventually we will have this. Yeah. So um, I think that's another role is like a list editor. Because an editor could be different from the creator, right? So if you share, and, and this gets into the features of being able to share access to a list. You have the initial person that created it, but now it's potentially a collaborative effort where they can add other people, and those other people have the ability to add channels to the list as well. Um, an internal name for the admin? Yeah. Um, scoping and writing user stories is an art of its own. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and along with Chris, thank you for the resub. Um, my sub can drink now. Is it 18 months? 21 months. Nice. Nice. Maybe, I think, like, eventually, yeah, so, like I said earlier, because this could apply to uh, Instagram, TikTok, we could also do Twitter. So, like, you could have a Twitter feed with only, I think, technically, you can do that on Twitter. I think, like, Twitter, on Twitter, people create uh, like they can add you to lists because I've been added to like dev lists before. So Twitter kind of already has that feature, but yeah. Interesting point. So like as a, yeah, so I don't know if we'll do this because the other thing that we'll talk about, especially when we're like prioritizing is MVP, which is uh, minimum viable product right now i talked about how cool it would be for a content creator to see analytics of like who's adding them to what list and stuff but honestly i don't think this is mvp this is not minimum viable product because we could have a working app that works for visitors list creators and editors um and we could get that out to the world right we can go ahead and we don't have to wait until we've already added these features because we can get people to start using the app and then we can start working on this feature and launch it later. But something like this, I don't think is necessary, necessarily minimum viable product. Same thing as super admin, depending on the system that you build, it may or may not be minimum viable product. For our system, I don't think it's a minimum viable product. Like I don't need to be able to see all the users in the system and everything else. Eventually that will be cool, but I don't need to do that right now. Uh, and then along the same line, lines, um, it might actually make sense as, as an as a user 
under 13. I don't know. We have to be really careful about that because there are laws around how old people can be to sign up. Um, YouTube technically allows people under 13 to sign up, um, but they they basically lock down the app. Like you, you, There's a lot of things you can't do as an underage user. Um, and this might be something we consider, whereas like if you are um, under a certain age, um, we we change how the UI works. Like we don't show comments or maybe certain channels that have been rated as an as older. We don't show. Yes. Uh, a user that is not of. Hey, I, 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 there needs to be a better way to write this. I I, I don't because it because it varies. Um, yeah. List editor is a permission, not a role. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, like, this is my other thing. Like, and, and honestly, this is my grand idea, right? Like, right now, we are at the mercy of the algorithm, the, the YouTube suggestion algorithm, the TikTok suggestion algorithm. But what if, I mean, honestly, TikTok needs this. I think the reason TikTok is the way it is is because it makes them more money to just show you random stuff. Honestly, like their algorithm can get get better, but what if you could say these are all the uh, tech and JavaScript content creators on TikTok, and now you just have a feed of of those specific users? You can't do that right now, and this app potentially would let you do that too. Um, multiple platforms for sure. Um, pull requests. Oh. So instead of a list editor, a list suggestor. Again, I don't think this is MVP, but that's a cool feature, right? So like, what if you have somebody that creates the list and then someone comes along and they're like, oh, I think you should add these channels to the list. They could make that suggestion and then it's up to the creator to go in and accept that suggestion. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter list of all the people I'm following, which is right now it's none. Um, but I do have an idea of who the first one's going to be. Yeah. How does a lurker interact with the list beyond viewing and liking it? Well, just just viewing. Um, think of it like right now, if you go to YouTube and you're not logged in, um, technically it'll still start recommending things after you click on videos. So like, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a nicer term than normie, but this this is normie YouTube, right? You've got all these like main channels that like most people click on. Um, and until YouTube knows what you like, it's going to just be suggesting the stuff that has like the most views. Um, but I imagine the, the experience is similar, right? So you just go in to watch a video. Uh, this is a new thing that YouTube released. Like you can go by, um, topic, but the one issue I have with that is you can't choose pop culture YouTube. I think that's a nicer term, to <laughs> but with these, you can't choose the channels, right? You're choosing the topic, but that'll show you all channels that it thinks have published content in that topic. Um, so yeah, basically all I'm saying is the, it'll work in a similar way to not being logged in. A lot of clickbait thumbnails, yep, yep. Yeah. A junior human, <laughs> underaged user? Yeah. Restricted user. I like that better. All right, we spent longer than 15. I mean, we've only come up with the roles. Now we need to come up with the epic stories. <laughs> but yeah, and, but this is what I'm talking about is like with this idea in mind, we could create user stories that specifically detail how we would have a site where only where kids would be able to use the site. Where like we don't show comments, we hide uh, stuff that's meant for older people, that kind of thing. Is super user standardized? Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, uh, Timon. We chose Svelte Kit. Exactly, Code Brains. Um, that's the hope. I mean, the thing is, like, somebody could take this idea and like do it better and do it faster. At the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves uh, we are doing this 
kind of for content. <laughs> like we're we're doing this because you and the you all in the community like to provide suggestions. You also like to see me in my process. Like it's possible that somebody else builds this and it gets way more popular than ours. I'm not worried about that right now. You, if you if you're used to to how I do things here on the coding garden, I'm not very business minded. Um, so I honestly don't even care if somebody else comes along and and builds one that's better. We're doing this to learn about the process, the planning process, the database design, the actual build itself. Yeah. No, e exactly, uh, Robert Tables. I mean, we, we've had to do, our mod team has had to do that in the past. Anybody that just jokes and says they're underage, it's like, we have to take it at face value and like Twitch will get onto us if we don't moderate our chat and, and report those kinds of things. A basic user. <laughs> yeah, I guess, but basic can be taken pretty, ne pretty negatively as well. I really, it is underaged. Jeez, that's loud. Okay, 15 minutes is up. I didn't give us enough time because that's 15 minutes of user roles. I think the thing is, I think we got a good amount of user roles because uh, you, you saw me talking about it, right? Like we're, we're basically thinking about the features of the app from all of these different perspectives because that's gonna inform how we build the app and also how we prioritize the features. Uh, like I said, we're trying to do minimum viable products, so we're probably going to focus on guest users, list creators, um, and list editor. That's probably, all, for MVP, this is all we need, right? Just being able to create lists and watch lists. Everything else is extra, it's, it's good ideas, and it's it's, in the real world, if we were trying to make money from this app, like it would make sense to expand our user base and make our app uh, more usable from other perspectives. But MVP, we're probably gonna stick with these. We? <laughs> and thank you, the she boss. Thanks, thanks for hanging out. Um, oh yeah, my my empty empty cup. I see. That makes sense, Timon. Are we gonna do office politics? <laughs> I mean, Twitch chat basically is office politics, right? Exactly the she boss. Like, eventually, I mean, not eventually. This all this code is gonna be on on GitHub. You can look at the code. You can see my process for how I think about uh, how I plan the features, how I actually write the code. Uh, in a way, this is insight into what it's like to be a software developer as well. What if we create before you deploy? I <laughs> mean, that's fine. What's up, Wucha? Welcome in. Um, so my plan right now, and that's when we're getting into the more technical aspects of it, I'm just going to use the YouTube iframe API. And the YouTube iframe API, uh, if you're currently logged into, into YouTube, it, it knows who you are in the, in the iframe. And it'll show you ads, like uh, if, if it would have shown you ads on the main YouTube. That's my plan right now. Um, it, it definitely, like YouTube has no API or no way of actually just taking the video content and embedding only that. You have to use their iframe API. So we're gonna do it legit, but that does come with some restrictions. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Amok, yeah. And the thing is like, I've, I've been on both sides of things and especially working at a smaller consultancy, I'm typically involved in this process uh, when we were building apps for people. Um, so yeah, under age, okay, a pee wee. <laughs> uh, I've never been diagnosed with ADHD, but I might have it. I am, I'm a heavy, heavy procrastinator. Yeah, super user basically would be, Honestly, I mean, we'd have to think about how we implement this too, right? Because uh, we're going to need a privacy policy and we need to be able to tell the user that, hey, super users of the site can can see what you do. We'll have to think about all of that. So yeah, what's up, regular dev? Welcome in. We want to do other platforms eventually. Right now we're focusing on YouTube. Yeah. All right. Um, let's let's come up with at least five epic stories. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna count up for this. 
however long it takes. But so like I said, a user story is from the perspective of a user role. So typically what you do is you brainstorm all the possible user roles. And like I said, um, each of these user roles might use your app in a different way. And when you start to think about how that user would use your app, it changes how you think about what features even need to exist in your app, right? So if we didn't talk about a list suggester, we wouldn't even have thought of the idea where someone could say, oh, you need to add this channel to the list, but they could make a request and then someone and then the owner could say, oh, that's really good. I'll, I'll merge that request. Um, if we if we didn't think about from this perspective, we probably would have never thought of that feature. So um, that's a thing. Yeah, a moderator. Sure. A site moderator. Yeah. So, yeah, if we, so if we think about now the actual uh, user story. So user stories, each one is written from the perspective of this. And uh, you, there are two types of user stories. You have your epic user stories. These are like big features that can be broken down into smaller user stories. So we're going to start with the epics. Um, and then later on, when we go to do an epic, we'll start to break it down into smaller user stories. So uh, let come up with the epics and feel free to throw some in the chat but basically the app that we're building allows users to create share and watch lists of YouTube channels so um, the one that Quickie Poo has, uh, has is as a list creator I want to easily see my created list so I on I think this would actually be not an epic user story this would be a user story under like list creation because under list creation I need to see my list edit my list update my list basically like crud so like what's a epic story for list creation. Yeah, so as a list creator, I want to manage my lists. That's it. That's the epic, right? Because the, the smaller user story is as a list creator, I want to create a list. I want to edit a list. I want to update a list. I want to share a list. All of those are going to be user stories under that epic. Um, I added a video for my friend who loves cooking videos. Um, what do you mean by that? But <laughs> I like cooking videos too. <laughs> um, uh, this is my longer break timer. Apparently we worked on user roles for 30 minutes. So that's a thing. Do it in GitHub projects. You're totally right. Well, I want to do it here and then like transfer it over. We're only gonna have like five. Crud some lists. As a lister, I want to be able to create a list so that I can view, share, delete, and delete my list. Yeah, and so this is another thing I didn't talk about is the the so that. So typically, you want to write uh, like why this user wants to do this thing. You don't have to, but it, it sometimes it adds value to put so that on there uh, so that you have a reason. Um, yeah, but so I, I would call this is like a more granular user story. I'm going to say manages the epic. <laughs> Beowulf is the first in the list of epics. Uh, and see you later, Jonah Coase. Thank you for hanging out. Um, as a lister, I would like to see popular lists. Yeah. An epic is grandiose in some literal, like, list creation and editing. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so another epic, like, we didn't really talk about is um, as a... Ooh. As a visitor, I want to sign up. and sign in. Now, again, uh, not again, but typically users, anytime you see the word and in a user story, it's that's a bad sign because it's like a compound user story and that typically means it needs to be broken out. Uh, yeah, pinning is a, is a newer thing, yeah. Um, as a visitor, I want to sign up. That's going to be another epic, right? And try to think about this. Like, what are going to be the, the some of the first things that we need to implement for this app? Because um, even things like filtering by category, like, th that's much more granular. That's going to be in, like, um, as a... Um, the thing is, I think we also need just, like, a list viewer. Because a list viewer is potentially halfway between a guest and a creator. Because a list viewer has an account on the system, but maybe they actually don't create lists. Maybe they just consume. Uh, and what's up, Ched? Welcome in. So yeah, like as a lister, um, 
as a uh, list viewer, I want to view a list. I guess. <laughs> Again, I, there's probably a better way to write this, but um, yeah. And then like as a user, I want to save my favorite lists. I think that would be um, almost like if we come up with another way to write this, because if this is a list viewer using the website by like um, they are watching existing lists, they're favoriting lists, they are sharing lists, all of that would handle be handled under here. So what, what's a better way to write the epic from the perspective of a list viewer? Yeah, and then like even this is like a more granular story because but, but I mean it's cool features, right? Like if you could literally import from a playlist and then it picks out all the channels and then adds that. What's up, Crazy Vulcan? Welcome in. NC Mario. Hello. List filtering and sorting. I like it. I want to sort filter view, sort, filter, and discover lists like th this is the perspective of someone just consuming media from the website right what stops a list viewer from creating a list eventually nothing and i guess i didn't clarify this but any one user could actually be in any one of these roles um just because you're a list viewer doesn't mean you're not a list creator because sometimes the the list creator is using the website as a list viewer like if you think about it uh, like on just youtube itself you have people that have youtube channels and create youtube videos um, and that's one thing they do. And so for them, YouTube Studio, basically that was an epic story to implement YouTube Studio so that as a content creator, I can upload videos, I can see my analytics. But as a content creator, I also just watch YouTube. So when I'm not in YouTube Studio, I'm on YouTube proper and I'm just watching videos. So at that point, I'm treating, well, YouTube is treating me like I'm a viewer, not necessarily a creator. Um, so uh, people can, can bounce between these roles. They're not limited to just one. Yeah, this is all going to be on GitHub. Oh, we didn't talk about privacy, but I think that's going to be underneath managing lists, right? So you create the list, but then you can decide if it's public or not. Watch the list for new entries. Yeah, I think that's going to be here on viewing, sorting, discovering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a potential another use. <laughs> I didn't think about this, but like... How do you structure your site so that, I mean, basically it's search engine optimization, right? It is, um, um, the site should be easily indexable. And that I don't, isn't necessarily a user story. The, the other thing in Agile, you have this idea of constraints. Um, and these are things that when you're implementing everything else, you always think about this. So like, uh, should be easily search engine optimized, um, should be uh, responsive. Um, again, there's probably a better way to word these in that they're better, <laughs> they're better worded constraints, but you could word it this way, and that way, any other story that you're working on, you're always keeping these constraints in mind. Yeah. Interact, yeah, so I think, I think this is, this is it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I appreciate everybody for hanging out today. There's, there's a lot of people. I mean, we had that big raid earlier. Um, and yeah, a lot of people are hanging out. I appreciate it. <laughs> As a VI user, I want to be able to exit a list. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I think you're right, quick, right? So this also needs, like, I want to find, view, sort, filter, and discover lists. Um, and really... I want to interact with, and that entails all of this other things. Yeah, yeah, and and I agree, I agree with that. So that's why, like a guest user, they don't have any features that uh, saves anything, right? They can't favorite things, they can't uh, suggest new things. They basically can only view. But once they sign up, now they have those abilities to like favorite and everything else. Yeah, so commenting on lists, I think that's uh, another thing that's going to fall under, under interacting. 
So the epic is list viewing and social interactions. As an unauth user, I should be prompted to sign up when attempting to social interactions. As an auth user, I want to be able to favorite an entire list, or I want to be able to favorite an item in a list. Yeah. So Codex has it. Codex has definitely been, been in the agile world. Um, and I, I like I see a lot of your suggestions. And the reason I'm skipping over your suggestions is right now I only want epics. I want the high level stuff that all the other things are going to be uh, underneath. Because later on, when we go to work on those epics, we will break it down into the into the smaller ones. As a list creator, I want to be able to fork an existing list. Um, I guess that wouldn't exactly fall under management. But maybe it, it does fall under management because instead of creating a list, you fork an existing one. So maybe that does fall under that. <laughs> what if every list just has coding garden? Nah. Yeah, yeah, accessibility is another constraint. Um, should be accessible. I've been programming and coding for over 15 years. So. Shall be? Should be? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> As a list viewer, I want to manage my account. Change password, edit profile. I like that. So as a visitor, I want to sign up. As a... Um... Yeah, and I think the thing is, list viewer, I'm also coming up... This is essentially like general user. I need a role for this. So like as a general user, I want to manage my account. This is another epic story, because this has to do with like signing out, Editing your profile, I feel like all of this is an epic. Um, I guess really, as a new user, I guess we, if we could all agree on agree that list viewer is a general user of the site, regardless, basically a logged in user, and it makes sense as a list viewer. I want to manage my account. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Kakush. Epics are too precise and more like a poorly written story. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I use mainly like uh, JavaScript and TypeScript here. I don't really do PHP. As a cool guy, I want to be able to be cool. <laughs> Asa should not be in an epic. In my experience, we did have them in epics, but I see what you're saying. Where like an, an epic is almost just like a label. So when we have a, a, a user user story that is more fine grained, it has a label of that epic. I see what you mean. Oh, you're well, you're very welcome, bloated knickknack. That's glad to hear. You you just got your diploma in web app development. Thank you for everything you've done, as you've been a massive inspiration to me. I appreciate that, bloated knickknack. Heart, hearts in chat for bloated knickknack, and congrats on on getting your diploma. Yeah. This meeting will be over much quicker if everyone in chat was standing up for it. <laughs> I will say, typically. Um, in in the in my, in my experience in the past, I've spent an entire day, like eight hour an eight eight hour day, in a room brainstorming with people just on roles, and then eventually just on user stories. Like, especially for like a, a company that's like they are building their product, this is a process you don't want to. Ru We're rushing here because I mean it, this is not a super complex app. But you can spend a lot of time coming up with roles and then eventually coming up with epics. Like, th this, this can be a very tedious process for sure. Yeah. List. List. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think suggestion... I guess technically they, then it wouldn't be a list viewer. Um, so we'll create an epic for them. As a list suggester, did I spell that right? Make suggestions to lists. I like that. And I guess this is the other thing about epics is like we're kind of writing them from all of the different roles that we came up with. So we have guests, we have viewer, and we have creator. Creator and editor are kind of one and the same. A lister. As a logged in user, registered user, yeah. The thing is, like, you typically wouldn't have a role of registered user. You try to come up with, instead of registered user, you try to come up with a name for the people that use your app. And I think, like, what people were saying is, like, lister. As a lister. 
As a parent, I want visibility and management of my child's account. Yeah, that gets into... <laughs> so, like, um, a parent of an underaged user. Multi-language support would be in this epic. Um, internationalization can be its own epic. It also could be a constraint. Should be uh, easily internationalized. I guess I don't know. Again, if you're if you're a project manager or like a scrum person and you're watching this and you're like, oh my god, like there are better ways to word this and like this probably could be in the in stories rather than constraints, but yeah. I mean, we're technically starting this build now, but <laughs> I think so. I I want to be gone in like twenty minutes, so um, we will at least set up the app. So a after we get probably one more epic, I'm gonna add those into GitHub projects, and then we'll we'll set up the basic app with SvelteKit and Prisma. Oh, nice! I am Speedy. Glad I'm glad you found me. An epic is like a feature set of grouping of features. It spans a lot of stories that cover many personas and lenses. Right. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Honestly, I could be convinced um, to not write these as user stories because each epic could have multiple user roles within it. I think you convinced me, Codex. Yeah. Agile doesn't mean there's no planning or meetings. It just means you meet about the most pertinent things, ideally. Um, registered. <laughs> Any book recommendations on setting up user stories? Um, the only book I slightly read was, there's a book called like Coaching Agile or Agile Coaching. I, I don't remember what it's called. I don't have, I don't read a lot of books. There's a lot of good online resources, I think. Yeah. As a revenue generating unit, I want to be able to give the web app company my money. <laughs> And that's it. We haven't talked about monetization here. I don't think I'm even going to talk about monetization. But I, I know people did want to see monetization. List suggester seems weird to me. Yeah, you're right. They they are more so a channel suggester, but they're su making suggestions onto a list, which is why we're calling them a list suggester. I see how it could be confusing. If you're a PM watching this, treat your devs better. <laughs> PMs don't watch coding changes. I actually know there are quite a few people that hang out here that are really in like project management and stuff. Okay, I agree with that clicky poo. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I've been convinced that this epic is now account management. So this is uh, sign up and account management. This is list management. Uh, this is list interaction. And this is list suggestion. Wow, we typed for like 45 minutes for, the, for these four bullet points. <laughs> It's fine. We're all we're all learning something. I, I think a lot of people are like for a lot of people, this is the first time they're even being exposed to the idea of like epics or user stories. All right, now and now the point is and now now <laughs> how do we add epics in um in here? Should I add epic as a field? And this will be a selecting box? Yeah, I think this is it. So every story is going to have a field for epic. I like that. That makes sense, right? Not everyone nod. <laughs> and Codex says there's a whole lot of ways to break up epics. Uh, you can make sign up flow its own epic to cover a lot of use cases. Sign up form. Yeah, I think sign up and account management. Um, I think it does make sense to be an epic, though. And then list viewing and interaction. So list viewing can happen from the guest perspective. It could also happen from someone who's logged in that wants to favorite a list or someone that wants to, well, I guess suggestion is a completely other epic. You can introduce features which are between epics and stories. Usually epics hold the business value, whereas features group user stories. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I th that's okay, because I did that in the past. You saw, um, like, Oscar made a bunch of pull requests for... Um, for the app, and, and we merged them in. Like, we reviewed their code and then merged them in. Um, oh, yeah, okay, we, I'll, I'll add that here. So, like, list social features. So, commenting. Honestly, I like that better than suggesting. So, social features. Commenting, sharing, suggesting. Yeah. Cool. 45 minutes of talking for something that we can't even see. But the thing, when we go into add a user story, like, um, and I guess the other epic, uh, I mean, and you all, you all tell me, uh, people that have experience like with agile and stuff, like would it make sense to have an epic that is just like DevOps? So like uh, setting up of the repo, getting the deployment going, um, is that an epic or is that more of a, task label like a bucket yeah yeah should i call it devops it's more a task other <laughs> task with stories all right but that's what I mean. So here's here's what I'm thinking. Like the first story I want to add is project setup and Prisma setup. Where do I put those? Oh, you got seven TV. Nice, nice. Yeah, there's some other cool things. Like because I'm a seven TV supporter. Look at that. My my name is glowing. I thought epics weren't from a dev perspective. They weren't, but we're doing a modified casual. We're doing casual agile. <laughs> um, this is my, my break timer, by the way. Take a stretch. Get out your seat. Um, I, 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 I need to not just think about this as much. Um, I'm I'm just gonna call it I'm gonna call it DevOps. You can't stop me. I'm gonna call it DevOps and anything that that will go under that. Project configuration and setup. But the thing is, there's gonna be more dev tasks so like provisioning a client ID in secret for Google, a uh, Google login. Um, I guess probably that would be a task under the story for login. I don't know. Support for zero layered w with emotes. I don't know, Alka, but this is what he's talking about. Basically, <laughs> it overlays the. Um, uh, the emotes on top of each other. This sounds like a really hard thing to do. I don't know. Uh, an EE that would exist under a dev group epic that is tracking all the effort that doesn't consist of business value. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing here. So, uh, project setup. Um, convert to issue? On listed? And then, uh, where are those custom fields at? Epic. DevOps. Nice. Nice. Um, and bloated knickknack. Thank you very much for that reset. A negative margin left? Yeah, that does blow my mind. <laughs> that would be pretty easy. Like, the, I guess the hard part is detecting that they're in order. But if they're in order, well, I guess they don't have to be in order. You just give it a negative margin left. Not opposed to it. Um, pro oh, we can call it backlog. Project setup. Um, honestly, project setup is going to have multiple things in it. So we'll do this as tasks in a list. Um, initialize Svelte kit project. Add Prisma 
set up initial prisma schema. Seems fine. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, yeah, we won't do uh, page design today, but we'll, we'll do that next time. And so my, my idea is like, as we go into actually write features, we're going to take one of these epics and start breaking it down into more user stories. And then we'll add those um, to the project board. In the real world, you would do a lot of that up front um, because in the real world, you're working... All, all of this stuff are communication tools. How do you make sure that everyone working on the project is on the same page, right? Um, and if you do it as you go, it's harder to have everyone on the same page because the person creating the stories has the image of the project in their head that no one else had yet. So typically you do at least want to have those created so when people come into the project, they know what they're getting into. Um, so yeah, I, I would say those are other epics then, right? So like uh, database design, not epics, but like this is gonna be another, um, another thing. And then this is under DevOps. Um, I think we're going to do the initial schema. We still have to think about, or we have to figure out what auth library we're going to be using, and that will inform our, our database design, I think, a little bit. Uh, we, we just need to do the project setup. That's that's the main thing we need to do here. So here we go. Let's let's. It's time for some actual code. I've been live for almost four hours. I guess technically I've been I've been showing you code, but I haven't written any code. But we're gonna use SvelteKit. Uh, let's go. Let's create a project. We need to run this command, and um, we have a name listed. Why did Zish do that? No. I literally want to call it listed. <laughs> I see. It was it was like a typo checker. Product owner garden. Do we want a mono repo? I th I think everything will be in this SvelteKit app. So like SvelteKit is gonna be our, our API, our front end, it'll have our database code. It's all gonna be in, in one. I can't imagine we would add anything else to it. Can anyone convince me otherwise? I, it might be a uh, high vis. We, we found that this is a a Twitch issue because in my recordings the the colors are not blinking, but I think through the transcoding of Twitch, like it can't figure things out and then it blinks for whatever reason. <laughs> we haven't even started and we've got issues. Uh, I really like the the Mac. It's it's really nice. The battery lasts forever. The fans almost never spin up. Yeah. Uh, some advice about management, um, how to estimate the date of a progress when nobody knows how to do that feature or module. Yeah, we haven't even gotten into, uh, um, what's the word? Estimating, estimating. That's another thing in agile. You typically estimate relatively though. So you, you pick one thing that you know how to do, right? So th these are known knowns, you know, you know that setting up the app is going to take one hour. So now that, that task is labeled as a, like a small or whatever. And then every, every other thing is estimated relative to that. So like, I know that setting up is going to take an hour. This other task is like relative to that is like maybe twice or three times that. So we'll rate it a three. So that's, that's the, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, some people also use uh, like t-shirt sizing, like small, medium, large. But the thing about it, the Fibonacci sequence is it like, it gets really big. Um, and if you're estimating with that, that typically means that there are a lot of known uh, un unknown unknowns, <laughs> like things you don't know or things you it's going to take some time to figure out that you can't even estimate yet. Um, so we we, uh, we 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 do that. OK, which skelt felt app do I want? I think I just want the skeleton project. Skeleton. Uh, we're going to use TypeScript. We will take ESLint. We'll take prettier. Uh, we'll do Playwright. Yeah, I mentioned we would use Cypress, but I guess we'll use Playwright. They're going to set it up for us. And then we'll have Vtest. I don't know how many unit tests we're actually going to write, but it'll be available to us. 
Um, let's install dependencies. Carbon components. I like Daisy better. Or actually, no. We ended up using Skeleton, didn't we? These are cool, though. It's got, like, that flat look. Yeah. Uh, it's blue, yeah. Well, actually, I don't even have a scene where you can see my, um, my screen. Let me show you real quick. Behind, behind the scenes. Um... Doo -doo -doo -doo. It's blue. It's a, it's a big old blue screen. Um, and then this one is also a big old blue screen. You also see like the weird the weird tape over there. Um, so this is me just standing in a, a blue room. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then I chroma key it out. Um, where are we at? We're over here. Why so blue? You just blew my <laughs> magic is ruined. Okay. We have ourselves ourselves an app. We install the dependencies. Let's run it. Should give us a Svelte Kit app. Beautiful. I love it. Um, we also need a Tailwind and UI component setup. That's going to be another one. We're not going to do that today, but we will need to do that. Um, yeah. And then this is going to be under DevOps. I guess it is easy to add, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't want to get distracted because right now we're in project setup. This is what we're doing, and I, this is what I said we're going to do. We have our Svelte Kit project. Let's go ahead and add Prisma and then get the initial Prisma schema. So um, Prisma is the ORM we're going to be using for our database. ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper. It basically allows us to uh, write code for our database that is object-oriented. So instead of having to write raw SQL code or even uh, write code that gets... Uh, like, but, or even using like a query builder like Connects, this is an object relational mapper. Um, and so it, after you set up all of your objects, it makes it really easy to query, to do relationships, different stuff like that. So here we go. We are going to, we don't need the TypeScript stuff. We should just need Prisma because we already have those TypeScript dependencies. Um, first try, uh, it, it's, it's just going to work. <laughs> so if you look at our Svelte Kit app, it has it. Sh it already has all this TypeScript stuff. Um, we're just going to be adding Prisma into here. I've never heard of Hibernate, but anything that's an ORM. So like Mongoose is an ORM for Mongo. Uh, SQLize is a pretty popular ORM, but Prisma is the is the is the one these days. Why are uh, why are we using Tailwind over some mobile oriented framework for the UI components? You know, I'm not opposed to using that. That one that Oscar shared, like, do we want this to look like a mobile app? I don't think we do. I think we want like our own like branding and 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 right. I don't know. Uh, Prisma supports Oracle, as far as I know. Yep. Typo RM is another one, but I've had a lot of issues with Typo RM. <laughs> yeah. Um, wait, does Prisma not support Oracle? Reference. System requirements. Connect your database. Oh, I guess they don't. I lied. Yeah, they don't support Oracle. Well, I'm not going to set up the linter today. <laughs> um... Postgres is a DBMS, a database, database management system. Prisma is an ORM, an object relational mapper that will let you talk to your DBMS. So all of these are DBMSs, MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, PlanetScale, uh, Cockroach. Yeah. 
uh, MongoDB is MongoDB. Like we're going to be using a SQL database. That's I think that's the main the main issue here is, and Prisma will make it really easy to work with our with our SQL database. So yeah, this is the. It's based on Tailwind, but like you can make your app look like it's on iOS, but it's just it's just Tailwind CSS. Or you can swap, you can change the theme and make it look like Material Design. This is really cool. The issue is, I want this app to work on desktop too, and if we use this, then we're kind of like forcing people to have like an. I guess if we're on desktop, then we just use the Material theme. I don't know. Yeah. Hibernate is a Java ORM. Okay, yeah. So, yes. And then, like, in the C-sharp world, we have um, um, Entity Framework. So Entity Framework is comparable to Prisma, but Prisma is for the JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem. Um, you can change the colors to match the branding. Dark mode. Color theme. Green. It's pretty slick. This is this is really nice. And I guess it just works with Tailwind. Um so it'll just it'll just work. But then they have components for Svelte. This is nice. We'll just make that another episode, picking a component library, because our choices choices are Consta, Skeleton, or Daisy. Those will be our three choices. We'll we'll do that another day. Do you have to generate the models automatically or do you have to write it by hand? I'll show you. We're going to show you right now, right here, right now. Here we go. So, um, quick start. We need to install uh, Prisma. It says save it as a dev dependency. That can't be true, right? Because then we're going to be importing Prisma client. Oh, well, I'll do what they say. Um, so we're going to install as a dev dependency Prisma. Um, Prisma client is a separate package. Okay. And then we need to init with our data source provider. Development is so hard. Because <laughs> uh, um, at this point, if we want to use like Postgres, then I'd probably have to spin up a Docker container with Postgres inside of it. We're just going to go with SQLite for now. SQLite for now. In a future episode, when we're full on designing the database, we'll pull in we'll pull in Postgres. Right now, it's just going to be basic basic setup. So, for now, it's SQLite, which is a file based database. Uh, if you look up uh, SQLite, um, I talked about earlier how all of those other things were DBMSs or database management systems, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, others <laughs> like MariaDB or MySQL. All of those are full software suites for managing your database. SQLite is literally just a file, just a file. Uh, it's really good for development or system, systems that um, are not multi-user, though there are some libraries that can that can work well enough with a single process. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what I'm thinking, Oscar, because like people have released tools that actually allow you to use SQLite in production, um, but uh, it can't do horizontal scaling like you would be able to do if you're talking to a, 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 a relational database management system. Horizontal scaling means you have multiple instances that can spin up. With SQLite, if you did that, then every instance would have their own SQLite file, and you don't want that. There probably is a way to proxy them all to the same, but then at that point, you just need a relational database management system. I don't know. We're going to do this for the initial setup so that I don't have to set up Docker right now because it is just a fat file, uh, <laughs> a flat file, not a fat, a flat file. It's just a file. OK, now we need a model. So in our code, uh, we have a Prisma folder and we have a schema. Would you look at that? So when I when I installed Prisma, it actually did all of that for me. Uh, you can see that um, it uh, added the provider as SQLite and then did it generate a .env? 
I'm gonna risk it. Am I? I'm not leaking anything. It's a brand new app. Yeah. So it generated this .env to say that the database URL is literally a file called dev.db, and so that's how SQLite works. It just talks to a flat file. Uh, so this is ready to go to talk to a file, and then you can start designing your database. Um, so I think for now we will just have um, a user, just to get it going, just to get the app the initial version of the app because in a, in a future episode probably next time we will design all of the the schema and everything else that we're going to need so they have their own um modeling language so what we're looking right now at right now is literally a prisma schema it's a custom custom language that they wrote um do we have like format Cool. Like this. So, um, we can we can we can define our our user model, and this is essentially going to map to a table called user that has an auto incrementing ID column, and a name column that is of type string. Um, that's crazy, me yeah, Andre. It's faster than the file system. All right, see you later, Ray just said. We're, we're, we're going to be done pretty soon anyways. Uh, and then next time, lots of code, lots of code. Um, so I'm just, honestly, just this for now. When we actually design the database, we're going to come in here and create many different models, right? So like, we'll probably have like the, the user model, but then we also need like the um, YouTube account model. And this will have like the YouTube user ID, um, and it will have uh, like the avatar URL, this kind of thing. Yeah, I know my time is pretty much up. So th there's a lot more modeling that we need to do, but for now we'll just have this basic model and we'll commit this in, in, in our initial commit. Um, so if I save that file and then I run this command, it's going to take yeah, it's probably going to be a social account, right? Because then right now we can log in with YouTube, but eventually you can log in with Instagram or, or anything else that we add. So yeah. Can you split your models over multiple Prisma files? I've never done that before, but it might be possible. ID string because it's coming from their API. We would probably still have like a, a unique ID in our database. Um, can I have an avatar? <laughs> an avatar avatar? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, I don't know if they're, uh, they suggest keep it in one file. Okay. Um, so right now you'll see all I have is that schema file. If I run this command, it's going to inspect this schema and generate actual SQL code that I can run against my database. So I'm going to do this and then actually by, by default, it runs it against my database, but you'll see that it generated this migrations folder and here we have regular plain old SQL code, right? So like, I mean, probably if you're a database admin, you're looking at this and you're like, well, why didn't you just write the SQL code? But uh, the nice thing about this is it also generated TypeScript types for everything um, and generated a client so we can talk to our database. Um, so, oh, no worries, the SheBoss. I haven't seen it. I think I, think I want to, like, it's probably going to be good. I don't know. But this is really cool because you write your code using their custom Prisma syntax, generates the SQL, and then you can run this SQL against your database. And then in the future, if I add more properties or if I change my schema, so let's say I go in and I add um, avatar URL. All of this is going to change, but let's say I add that. I need to now um, add another migration. I can give it a name like add avatar. And if I run this... Uh, now it's going to generate a new migration, and migrations basically get run in order. So the first migration says, create the table as we did before. But then uh, we, we had some new business requirements. We needed to change the schema a little bit, and it generated how to go from this to a schema that has an avatar URL. And it probably is just... Um, yeah, and so it's, it's interesting the way that they do the migration. They, they essentially create a brand new table migrate all of the data into that table, drop the old table, and then rename the table. They have, they probably have a, a good reason for doing this. Um, and the SheBoss, thank you very much for that gift. But, but basically, 
as a developer, I don't have to worry about this SQL code that gets generated. I can just continuously update my schema, and it's and Prisma is going to uh, stay in charge of managing those migrations. Now, I'm actually just going to delete that migration. Um, uh, my database is out of sync now, though. <laughs> um, what if I do remove avatar? All data will be lost. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great, great. <laughs> uh, so now we're just back at the base schema that has the, oh, we're gonna wipe this out next time when we add more models, cool. Yeah, so this is Prisma, it's super cool. Uh, the other aspect here is that we can write code against it. And they have a cool tool called the, the Prisma Studio. Uh, somebody just asked, is there a way to see the data in my database? If you do MPX Prisma Studio, this launches uh, an app in the web browser, and this is kind of like PG admin or anything if you're used to that. So you can see the models in your database. You can even go in and like uh, add data. So name CJ, save it. Add another one. Um, Clicky poo. And then we'll also add the she boss. And then we'll also add uh, who's well it didn't it didn't save. <laughs> Please don't delete my list. I'll add Alka. Does, uh, does Prisma smartly combine migrations? Like if you add and remove columns a bunch of times, does it understand that the final schema is the same as starting one and skip the actual migration? I don't think so. And that's just based on my experience with migrations in general. Like each thing you do that is a new migration is like linear, it's it's a new migration in the list. So if you added and then you removed, it you never combine old ones because uh, basically this is this is a step-by-step -step process to get the database into the current state that it is today. So I don't think you would ever, it would ever like remove or combine these migration folders. Cool, yeah, so you have this. And then now let me show you something even cooler. Let's actually uh, query this database and show it in the UI. So right now in the UI, I just have like this basic homepage. Uh, Let's start it back up. Yeah, so I have this basic homepage. Let's list those users from the database. So uh, now we're getting into, into Svelte Kit. So I have this page.svelte. I can create a page.server.ts, and this will be my server side code that queries the database. Um, and then let's go look at the Svelte docs on how to do that. So, like loading data. And I want this this buddy here. Let's switch to the TypeScript docs. I want this one. Um, and then uh, the Prisma client um, is how we actually uh, talk to our database. And, and basically, what happened earlier is when I ran when I ran those migrations, it also generated TypeScript types that correspond to this to this schema here. So if I look in the node modules folder, there is now a, um, or there should be a Prisma client library that has all of my types. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. They're somewhere in here, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll show you really quick. So if we create an instance of the Prisma client, we can actually query the database. Uh, dot Prisma is the generated client. I see. There it is. See, it, it literally generated a TypeScript type that corresponds to that schema. I, like basically, you don't touch this file. This is auto-generated. But now what that means is I get I get type completion when I'm querying the database. So over here in this in the server, I can import um, something from uh, Prisma client. And is it just Prisma? Yeah, it's just Prisma client. And then I can create an instance of it. I think I should just look at the docs. <laughs> um, we modeled it. We ran it. Oh, I have to do new. New, yeah, you got it, Zelino. Create an instance of Prisma client. Now I have a client that I can actually query. So uh, this is gonna be some code that runs here on the on the server side. We're not gonna take in any arguments here. And we're gonna get back the users, which is gonna be await 
watch type completion client dot user dot find mini. So this is how we query the database for all of our all of our users. But you can see the return type. Um, let's let's store it in a variable so you can see that it has like full type completion. So I'll say where users is that find them all in our database and then return them here. But if you look at users, this is an array of user, and that's the specific type that got generated. So this is our server side code that queries the database. And then in this file uh, is the one that actually renders it out on the page. So to render it, we need to do this. Um, so page data is like a auto-generated type that SvelteKit gives you. And then now we can see that data has that type, users of uh, array of user. So I def they're calling my database here. I can use them over here. And then now, um, oh, thank you, Chua. Yeah, there's de there's a better way to do this. I'm This, this code is eventually going to get thrown away, but that's a good point. Um, there's a better place to create this client because <laughs> right now I like in the real world you're going to have multiple things that all need access to the client and you don't want to create multiple instances uh, you're, you're, you're totally right but this this is going to be throwaway code so this sh should be good enough for now um yeah it would be you're you're, you're right <laughs> you're totally right but let, let me just show this example okay um i am i am now entering the world of svelte development can I do an each block without looking in the docs? I don't think I can, because I think it's like, is it like this? Oh, oh, each data dot users as user. Is this it? I think I did it. I did it. <laughs> well, really, the editor did it. I don't know what I'm using, but I have it gave it gave me a little snippet. <laughs> um, and then I need user dot, we get type completion, user dot name. So that's cool. First try. So what's going to happen is when the page is requested on the server side, we query the database. We then render the page with that list of users. Um, there it is. There's all the users in our database. So Prisma, real nice. Real, real, real nice. Easy, yeah. And again, <laughs> honestly, I'll just I'll just delete this file because people are going to complain. There, there's a better way to do this. We want to share this instance anywhere we we call it. Honestly, we're also going to be using TRPC. So TRPC is really the only place we'll be using the actual Prisma client instead of inside of our loaders. So, yeah, yeah. So this is a spelt thing. I honestly don't know <laughs> what is the what does the plus sign mean. Um. Plus page. A plus page component defines a page of our app. By default, pages are rendered both on the server for the initial request and the browser for subsequent navigation. It might just be a convention. I, I don't know why. Why the plus sign? Any anybody know? It's to signal to SvelteKit that this is a okay. That makes sense because if I go in here and I just add some other TypeScript. Um. Quick stretch. Mm. Yeah, so if I add this banana.ts, uh, this does not create a route for slash banana. At least that's what I'm hearing. So if I try to go to slash banana, I'm going to get a not found. Yes. But if I call this plus banana, <laughs> Well, then I'd have to actually have a, an actual page, banana.svelte. Um, and then instead of, I mean, this just this will just be a page with a div that has the banana inside of it. I guess we're going to we're going to learn, but um, I might need a banana folder with a page file inside of it. OK, it needs to be plus page, which means I actually need a folder called banana that has that file in there, and then I actually need to rename that to page.spelt. Page um, OK, so th this is the one thing that it feels cumbersome, because you literally have these plus pages all over the place. But I'll get used to it. I'll get used to it. But now look at that. Now we have a slash banana. <laughs> so ultimately, 
it's so that Svelte can differentiate. It's like only put the plus page if, if it actually is a page that should be rendered. Cool. Um, cool. Do I recommend using TypeScript? I do. I do. Like these days, is your, is your Twitch name literally 2600? That's amazing. How'd you get that? <laughs> your account wasn't created in 2007. That's awesome. Welcome in 2600. Um, any affiliation to the uh, 2600? Uh, is it a club? Is it, I don't know. But um, I do recommend TypeScript. Uh, pretty much any app these days that people are creating, if you're working on a team, you should be using TypeScript because uh, it it's basically like inline documentation with very little work. So in the example here was, um, first of all, we're using Prisma, which gives us the, the type of the users. So it generated that type for me, beautiful. And then now with SvelteKit, these types flow uh, flow through. Um, not that, that. This is gonna be the confusing bit though, right? I have two things called page.svelte and I can get lost in where they are. Um, but uh, now those types flow through. So if I look at my page data, now I have a list of users. And what I was saying earlier is we get type completion. So it's like user dot, and then it tells me what I should expect. So uh, TypeScript is really nice. Imagine you're working on a team and one developer is the one that's in charge of this route that's like much more complicated <laughs> um, with with more stuff happening. And then the, the other dev is in charge of this route. Now you don't need to share documentation on like, oh, these are the properties that are available. TypeScript just gives them to you. So yeah, I, I recommend use TypeScript. Uh, uh, welcome in uh, the only Jamel, glad to have you. But I, f I feel honored. <laughs> We've got 2,600 in the chat. That's awesome. And uh, Master 70 PT. Uh, Master 70 point. Thank you for that, Prime. Much appreciated. Did I miss others? I don't think I did. Okay. Prisma. Cool. Svelte. Pretty cool. Svelte gets pretty cool. What's up, Kevin Bronco? Welcome in. Um, all of this is going to get wiped out. Should I go ahead and delete it? I guess I'll leave it. This is going to be our initial commit here. Um, and delete that banana route. Um, but like, like I said, th this is not the way to do this. You want to share that instance. We'll, we'll set that up later. Svelte, kit, svelte, kit. Um, honestly, I'm just going to delete it. I'm going to delete it. Working with TypeScript today isn't nearly as cumbersome as it was two years ago, says Veep. Uh, I agree with that. And, um, it's getting better. It's only getting better. <laughs> the start of our billion dollar unicorn. Yeah. All right. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to get rid of that. We're gonna go back to the basic app um, because, because. Now, I need to add some things to my uh, git ignore. So we should be ignoring .env. And I also wanna ignore this dev.db because this is the actual SQL file. I don't wanna commit that to the code base, the SQLite file. Um, so don't commit that. All right, let's init this. Uh, we'll use main as the main branch. It's not going to commit those things. Um, yeah, you, you typically you commit the Prisma folder, but the Prisma folder just has your Prisma schema and your, your SQL migrations um, like this but you do not commit the Prisma client. So Prisma client is like hidden here in node modules. This actually doesn't get committed to the code base. Any developer that brings this code down runs uh, Prisma generate, and that generates the types locally for that user. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, ESLint is for another, another, another thing. So the SQL files you are, are source code, and you do commit those to your code base. Um, Basically, in this migrations folder, you, you commit these because other developers need to be able to run those migrations against the database that they create locally or the database they, that they connect to. Right now, we're, we're using SQLite, which is just a file. Next time, we'll rework this to, to talk to Postgres, but we'll need to set up a, a Docker container with Postgres. I don't feel like doing that today, so that should be it. Okay. Um, let's see what we got. This looks good to me. This is our initial app. Uh, let me update the readme. Listed media. 
an app that will allow users to uh, create, share, and watch lists of YouTube channels. Uh, what's the benefit of a Docker container? So that I don't have to install Postgres on my computer and so that I don't have to connect to a remote Postgres instance. With, with Docker, I could spin it up and spin it down when I'm, when I'm done with it. Um, that's enough for now. We'll, we'll do a whole other episode on writing a good readme, but not today. Anything else we need for this? Did I do anything weird? I need a license. I need a license. Um, MIT license. YouTube, TikTok, and more, but YouTube for now. <laughs> I'm here from the future. Google buys listed media for $100 million. It's so funny, though, because, like, this app is purely based on the APIs that they make available. The moment they don't like what I'm doing, they could just revoke my API access, right? It, so it's very weird to, like, base your whole company on someone else's API. I mean, a lot of people do it. You kind of have to in some ways, but it is a thing. Um, so... All right, here it is, everybody. Initial commit. <laughs> um, what's our what's our Git origin? Listed or listy. It'll it'll also be funny to uh, to see uh, how what people call it because because. <laughs> I'm calling it listed, but I do. I, there are going to be people that call it list D. Um, so yeah. All right, code is up there. If you want to look at it, I think it's pinned right now. Yeah. If you click click that link, it's just a basic Svelte app, but all the code we write is going to get pushed up here. <laughs> It'll be like the new GIF. Yeah. So like, is it is it listed? Is it list D? Listed. Listed. <laughs> okay. Um, what else did I say we were going to do? Yeah. Database schema and page design next Friday. So I'm, I'm going to end the stream here. This was a... This was, there were a lot of people here today. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here, for sticking around. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, check out the schedule. It's not up to date right now, but uh, if you look at this... Um, on Sunday, it should be up to date as to when I'm going to be streaming next week. Now, um, I think I'm going to stream on Sunday. So if, you, if you've looked at my YouTube channel, I'm trying a new thing where I do weekly news. Um, and yet, and last this week, I, I recorded it on Monday and published it on Tuesday. But next week, I think I'm going to, um, I'm going to stream on Sunday where we record the news segment so that it can be published on Monday. Yeah, Friday is seven days away. <laughs> so there's probably going to be a stream on Sunday. Monday, I'm going to release some YouTube videos. We need to do some streams where I just work on my overlays um, and, and stuff like my, my chat overlay here uh, needs work. There's some bugs in it um, and various other things. When is the workout stream? I don't, I don't plan on working out on stream. <laughs> uh, so definitely check the schedule. Uh, I have a couple of uh, videos up on YouTube. Please go check them out. Uh, I know for a lot of you, you're experienced programmers, so things like FizzBuzz, reverse the string, and find the minimum uh, don't seem appealing to you, but it helps the algorithm. So uh, if you could watch my latest videos, that would be great. And uh, I appreciate you. You're good. You're great. <laughs> Also, I have a TikTok now, so you can, <laughs> that's a new thing. Um, let's see how many I got. Two hundred views today on my on my TikTok. Um, refreshing is always a good thing. Oh, thank you, Fireball Monkey. I, I would I would like to think that I have provided a unique perspective on these problems. Right? I don't just solve them in one way. I talk about multiple ways to solve them. We also get input from Twitch chat, so like they show their solutions. I feel like this. Uh, beginners can get a lot out of this, but I think even like uh, mid-level devs can get get stuff out of this because you may not you may be at working as a front-end dev and not thinking about like little algorithm problems like this before. 
Um, I also have an Instagram now too, uh, so check that out too. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that pull request. See, look, look at look at my thumbnail game though. It's pretty good, right? Pretty good. Um, let's look at this PR. Reorder the get ignore. Move prism death to the bottom. It's between E and V's. I agree with that. I will instantly approve. <laughs> this and merge it in. look at this the power of open source um merge great so if you're wondering what just happened there oscar had a suggestion for the code that i wrote and i merged that suggestion in and there it is how to how to contribute 101 <laughs> all right let's go on a raid let's go on a raid um if you are um that Oh, glad to hear it, Fire Emblem Monkey. Yeah. You're doing a lot of similar stuff on a daily basis and see some other perspective. Yeah, I think it's like, on the surface level, it's like I show how to solve it from a very beginner perspective, right? So, like, you could get bored about me teaching about a for loop. But after that, you might learn something like array.from or reduce or, or something like that. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it was, it was so fun. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> one, one pull request, 50% of all commits, yeah. Okay, okay. Let's go on a raid. Uh, also, you can come up with your own raid message, but you all are great. I, I don't know why so many people tuned in today, but I appreciate it. I, I think the, the raid we got earlier today definitely helped. Um, from uh, PSK Halog raided, and then um, uh, Chris Nova raided as well earlier. So I, I appreciate that. Thanks for bringing all your friends over. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Um, and again, check the schedule. Join the Discord. I didn't mention that, but we do have a Discord. All right. Wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this. Mm -hmm.